it's a question like, does that kind of stuff have a place in a star Wars movie where everything has been so like sanded down and nice and neat? Welcome to the crooked table podcast where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this show, we democratize the film criticism conversation by bringing on fans and critics alike to talk about a movie of their choice, something they grew up with, or something they just have a connection to. That's what we usually do. But this episode, we are continuing our monthly investigation and journey through the Star Wars saga leading up to The Rise of Skywalker. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, and I'm welcoming, welcoming back to the show, Jackson Smith. Welcome back to the Crooked Table Podcast. Uh, I'm so excited to talk about this movie, Robert. I am. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, to pull the curtain back a little, this is also the second time we tried to have this conversation because we oh, yeah. did have some technical <laughs> difficulties last time. So uh, if we, you know, hopefully it will, we'll, we'll have our thoughts a little more encapsulated here and, uh, and it'll be a, actually a better listening experience <laughs> for people checking out this episode. <laughs> Yeah, more refined. Right, yeah. exactly. Well, our, our opinions will be more refined. So, so um, you know, I'd like to start off every one of the Star Wars episodes by talking a little bit about your experience with the saga. So, you know, tell us, you know, there's a significant age difference between the two of us. So I was in high school when, uh, when Phantom Menace came out. So tell me a little bit about your experience when you got into Star Wars. And then I guess uh, specifically leading into Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. So, so I'm, uh, I'm 24. So people, my age, the star Wars movies, we went and saw in theaters and we bought all the toys of, and, you know, played all the games of those were the prequels. Like I know most OG star Wars fans, they all, you know, went and saw the original trilogy in theaters when it came out. And then there's sort of the, that, that mid ground of people who are, who are like, weren't born yet or too young when the movies came out in theaters. So they saw them all on VHS when they were kids. And then there are people my age who grew up as the prequels were coming out. Like I saw Phantom Menace, I think when I was four, that was 99. So, um, too young to, you know, (laughs) notice the filmmaking deficiencies in it, but certainly old enough to go head over heels over it. Like I was, I was definitely a star Wars fan. I, my dad, um, my dad's an industry guy and he showed me all of the movies when I was, as soon as I was old enough to sit through a movie, all of the original trilogy, I watched all of the prequels that when they came out in theaters, Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones. But I got to say out of the prequels and probably out of all of the Star Wars movies that I've seen, save for maybe I, I, it's controversial saying this on air, but last Jedi, um, I think revenge of the Sith might be my favorite star Wars viewing experience. I think this movie, uh, had a really big impact on me, not just as a star Wars fan and not just as a, as somebody experiencing this very unique cinematic universe, but also as a movie fan, like there was a lot of, there was a lot of cinematic elements in that movie that I had not been exposed to yet. And a lot of moral elements in that movie that I had not been exposed exposed to yet. So it was a very big learning experience for young Jackson as a budding filmmaker and just a human being. So it's, it's a movie that's very near and dear to my heart. And I'm very, very excited to talk about it. It's funny too, because now everybody talks about the prequels, like, Oh, and the prequels, they happened. Let's just ignore (laughs) those. But at the time when these movies came out, people really liked them. Like they got very positive reviews and yeah, maybe certain elements like as I, like I talked about on the attack of the clones episode, like the romance and all that, which is probably the weakest element in honestly, in kind of the saga, uh, yeah. probably the weakest subplot in any of the films. <laughs> um, but the, there were reviews coming out when revenge of the Sith came out that were like the best one since empire, which now is a cliche thing to say about a star Wars movie, but at the time <laughs> felt true. And there was a level of hype going into revenge of the Sith because this was when we were finally going to see him turn into Darth Vader and, Um, it's as far as we knew the last star Wars film ever up to that point. Um, and then, you know, there's a certain level of hype with each of these trilogies because there's, you know, 16 years between the originals and the prequels, 10 years between the prequels and the sequel trilogy. So I wonder now if people growing up with, uh, the current trilogy, the, the sequel trilogy are, that's going to be, you know, that's the one that they're going to grow up with. So I wonder how they're going to feel about the prequels or the originals, honestly, at this point. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I I know personally, like I I didn't know that the prequels were like this really hated thing in the Star Wars community until I was in high school. Like I I even remember the moment specifically. Like I was I was at school, I was hanging out with some friends, and one of them was saying like, "Yeah, you know, the only good thing about the Star Wars prequels was John Williams' score." And I remember sitting there like, "Really? Like the like Revenge of the Sith? Like people don't like that movie?" And he's like, "No, those movies suck." And then, of course, you know, this is was Rotten Tomatoes is coming about and you go on Rotten Tomatoes and you read the reviews. And it was like a big it was an eye opening thing for me to find that these movies that were so key to my childhood weren't actually that popular with film people. Um, and, and that was something that happened. But that's something that happens a lot to anybody as they grow up. You know, you have movies that you watch when you're a kid and then you go back and watch them and revisit them later. And you either have this you either have this visceral nostalgia where you're able to kind of like forgive it no matter what, because this is the movie from my childhood. Right. You find out that it's like a really, really good movie, which I think is the case with revenge of the Sith. This movie has definitely taken on a very different meaning for me as an, this movie's taken on a very different meaning for me as an adult than it did for me when I was a kid, or you go back and you watch it and you're like, I can see why I liked that when I was like five years old, but that kind of sucks. And that's happened to me too. And it's, it's sad, but it's, it's also the nature of growing up. So in regards to the question about whether kids, these, what kids these days are going to think of the prequels. I don't know. I mean, I, this is the generation that is growing up with the, with the, the, the sequel trilogy with, you know, rise of Skywalker and last Jedi and, and force awakens. And, and those movies are very, they're great for their own reasons, but they're very, very different than the, than the prequels. They, they, they deal with different politics than the prequels. They deal with different, different issues than the prequels. They're different from a filmmaking standpoint. So I, I don't know. I don't know how, how, how younger people will react to these movies nowadays. I mean, you have kids. What, what, what have they thought of the prequels? I mean, my daughter's only two and a half, so we haven't really gotten into any of that yet. Uh, she, she knows actually, she knows who BB eight is and, uh, and okay. Ray and things like that, but she hasn't really seen, I showed her, I think some of the, um, what is it? The, the oh, I can't remember. There's a, there's a forces of destiny. That's what it is. The little YouTube. Oh yeah. Web yeah, series yeah. 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 That seems yeah. like it's mostly tailored to, young, you know, toddler girls, basically. So I'm like, well, that's For a perfect sure, yeah. way to just be like, look, this is who these characters are, just to like kind of get her feet wet before, obviously, Revenge of the Sith will be a, a long way down the line, and that's is a two and a half year old. Uh, yep. Social service, <laughs> child services will take me away. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, and I, I do think it's, it's notable that the sequel trilogy does feel like it's making a... a purposeful attempt to marry the aesthetics of the original and prequel trilogies. I mean, The Last mm. Jedi, possibly most of all, when they make, he makes direct reference to Darth Sidious came about, came, you know, rose to power with right under the Jedi's noses and they were completely arrogant and not paying attention to what was happening around them. And yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And like elements of uh, even just the, the balance of CG uh, effects and practical effects that you're seeing in the sequel trilogies. Like the, you can tell that they're, the Abrams and Johnson are are trying to make this all feel like it fits together because the prequel trilogy it does. I mean, it made it made by the same person who did the original Star Wars, but feels completely different in a lot of ways just because oh, of the, yeah. the technology and what he had available at that point. To the point where a large sequences of it, and we'll probably get into that with the climactic uh, lightsaber battle in Revenge of the Sith. Large sequences feel very video gamey and very you know. Uh, for that reason, haven't particularly aged well in some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I, the, it, it makes sense thematically too, because I think the sequel trilogy is all about making sense of, of the last generation star Wars. Like every character has some sort of relationship with, uh, and, and, and a person from a different era and a person from a different era of star Wars. And I, I think that's why I like this franchise so much is because it is very generational. You know, it's like star Wars means something very different to someone who saw it back in 1977 to it does to someone who saw it on VHS in the early nineties to someone who saw Phantom Menace in theaters as a four year old to someone who saw force awakens in theaters as a four year old. Right. And it's all, and, and I like that the series itself is about generations and about passing the torch and about this, this lineage and this, uh, you know, the, the Skywalkers inheriting, inheriting the, 
the, the power and the legacy of their forefathers and also the problems of their forefathers. You know, it's like I, and, and that's what makes the prequels interesting is because I think, you know, the movies since then have, have dealt with those movies and those, and the problems and the strengths of those movies in really interesting and complex ways. And that's a whole discussion in and of itself. Sure. <laughs> but, um, but I definitely, I agree with what you're saying. So yeah. And this, the prequels seem to be the, obviously the fall of Anakin and the, the original trilogy is the, the rise of Luke. And then, uh, the new one, I don't, I, we don't really see the, the fall of Kylo Ren, who is essentially the central Skywalker of this current trilogy. So it mm-hmm. remains to be seen whether he's going to be redeemed or what's going to happen in the next one. And, but that's the end of the, the end of the bloodline. He's the last Skywalker standing at this point, assuming that mm-hmm. they're going to write lay out in some, in some way, uh, over the course of yeah. this next movie. Yeah. Yeah. I will we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. So, well, we'll get to there. We'll get there in December, but for this, for this episode, we're going to talk about, of course, Revenge of the Sith, so let's listen to a little bit of the trailer right now. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. The Council wants you to report on all the Chancellor's dealings. That's treason. We are at war, Anakin. Very dangerous putting them together. I don't think the boy can handle it. I don't trust him. I need your help, son. I'm appointing you to be my personal representative on the Jedi Council. You're on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. What? Obi-Wan and the council don't trust me. Learn to know the dark side of the Force, and you will achieve a power greater than any Jedi. You're under arrest, Chancellor. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? That was a little bit of the trailer for Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, written and directed by George Lucas. This is uh, made 380 domestic, 848 worldwide. And I- I've read before, and I may have mentioned it to you before, that that uh, Lucas's outline for the backstory for Anakin Skywalker and Obi Wan Kenobi. He basically used roughly 60% of it in this movie. And I think going back and watching the prequel trilogy and seeing that the this film basically had, really does have kind of the meat and potatoes of the, the prequel story, you can see just how much filler there is in those first two films that he had to really kind of stretch it out to a certain point. So how, how do you feel about that? And if that, you know, if you happen to agree with that, do you think that um, he should have maybe started this, maybe started this story uh, the begins in Revenge of Sith maybe in the second film and had it be kind of a two-parter. We were mentioning before recording um, that the original version of this movie was like about four hours, probably the work print or whatever, but that yeah. that maybe this could have worked as like a two-hour uh, story and maybe even have uh, Anakin's fall to the dark side at the end of the second film and then the third film be like basically the second half of this. So that was a lot of lot for you to process, <laughs> but <laughs> no, yeah. general thoughts no, on that. It's a good question because, um, you know, I mean, there are those people who I, I don't know where this came from, but apparently like the quote unquote recommended Star Wars viewing for people who haven't seen it before, or, like a edited truncated version of episodes one and two and then Revenge of the Sith. So you're not even asked to watch the first two movies uh, because there's so much filler. Um I, I, I have to preface my opinion first by saying that I actually it's actually been a hot second since I've seen right. um, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. I did rewatch them, I think, before um, it was either before Force Awakens or Last Jedi came out. Like I, I sat down with my friends and we rewatched all of the Star Wars movies. Um, and I I don't know. I'm a little torn on that because I think on one hand, you know, obviously Lucas hadn't directed anything in decades and was dealing with all of this very new shiny technology and exploring all these really interesting political themes. And, and a lot of the, a lot of Anakin's story, I felt like fell by the wayside. You know, I mean, you can really tell that in attack of the clones where that romance subplot just, it it feels like it should be the heart of the movie, but it just kind of drags it down. And you're like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel right. Um, on the other hand, I think having, you know, watching revenge of the Sith now, you really see all the pieces of the prequels click into place in this movie. You know, you get to see this because this movie is all about sort of 
Palpatine's master plan for taking over the the galaxy and and the the intricacy with which that plays out and the and and seeing just how he's used the clone wars and he's used this really petty conflict to to sow this discord between the Jedi and the and the Galactic Republic and it, it, it's just it's really interesting and I thought all of that was that needed you needed those first two movies to really set that all up and 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 draft that conflict i mean like i I think you mentioned in your in your episode one podcast i confess i actually haven't listened to the your attack of the clones one yet um but in your episode one podcast you, you mentioned that this is kind of like this is like introducing everybody and setting the state yeah, like like a prologue, basically, to the rest of the story. It is like a prologue, and I, and I think you needed that going into Revenge of the Sith. I think if you were to jump right into Anakin and Obi-Wan, you know, trying to save the Chancellor, you'd be like, who are these people? <laughs> you know, how did they get here? Even if their development up to that point had been a little shaky, you did have a relationship between them. Like, I, I, I think, you know, Padme and Anakin's <laughs> relationship is thin even in this movie we'll get to that but but his relationship with obi-wan i think was really successfully built over those first two movies and and pays off in a really really emotional way in this one so so i don't know i i i think we need uh phantom menace and attack of the clones for for this movie to be good but i but i do agree with the general consensus that this is very clearly the best of the prequels both as a star wars movie and as a regular movie and i would venture as to say one of the best star wars movies period yeah I, I, for me it's it, it actually it's definitely i mean it's easily the best of the prequels i don't even that's not even not even have <laughs> a to, discussion like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it should be i've seen some people kind of defend phantom menace and say that that's actually one of the better one of the better ones of the prequels but i completely disagree um i actually like revenge of the sith better than return of the jedi and i know that putting any prequel above any of the original trilogy is kind of blasphemous in some star wars fan circles but i mean that's i i think you know yeah this this one this one doesn't really suffer from from the same problems as the previous two films in large part because it is so focused in large part because Lucas allows mm. it to go so much darker i mean this is this is by far I would by far by far the most violent of the Star Wars movies. It was the first oh, P, yes. first PG thirteen. They can't even say younglings at Galaxy's Edge because <laughs> in this movie they're like killing younglings, a hologram, oh, and you're killing man. younglings. Like, like, it's I all shouldn't about be laughing younglings. at that. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, you straight up have the hero that people have grown up with since they were four years old in a movie theater, being like, "This kid, I want to be this kid doing the pod racing." And you know, no, not not the grown up version murdering toddlers and and yeah, no, not that one. But um, yeah. It has very little of the stink that that kind of haunt, haunted the last two movies, um, whether that's in regards to the romance, whether that's regor- regards to Jar Jar Binks. A lot of that that got really scaled back. And I know I think we mentioned this during our first attempt at this conversation. But how do you do you think that that was a conscious effort on the part of Lucas to kind of steer away from elements that fans were really criticizing of, or do you think it's just a natural progression of uh, of this narrative that he had laid out? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you you hit the nail on the head when you said focus. I think what this movie has that the other two lack is a real narrative drive. Like it is about Anakin becoming Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. And it is and it tracks the the his descent to the dark side. Like that is the plot of the movie. And and then of course you also have Palpatine taking over the galaxy, but it's very, but it's intertwined with that in a very organic way. So automatically, I think this story just naturally lends itself to a better movie because it is a more focused story. But I also think I, you know, I think Lucas, the the prequels were a learning process for Lucas. I think a, like I said, he was navigating a new digital landscape and (laughs) <laughs> and it's it's hard to focus when you could, you literally have the world at your fingertips. Right. Um, but he it had also been a really long time since he had directed a movie, and I think uh, you know I think the the prequels, specifically Revenge of the Sith, was his journey to being able to tell a really really solid story again. Like I know I you know I, I was reading trivia on it the other day, and I, I I think I mentioned this in the last time we recorded, but it's in his original draft like. Anakin's motivations for turning to the dark side were very different. And then as he was writing and as he was doing the first two prequels and, and hearing people's responses to them, he was like, no, 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 we need more personal stakes. And that's when he came up with the whole 
premonitions of um, Padme's death and that being his desire to save her driving driving his actions for so much of that movie. And granted, you know, like the romance still isn't very fleshed out and I don't really think Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman have much chemistry, but it's like that is a very real and human desire that is acted on in what I believe to be tragic but human ways. So I I, I think you know, maybe he wouldn't have done that if Revenge of the Sith had been first. Maybe he w- it wouldn't have been that good and fleshed out had he just, like, jumped right into that right off the bat. You know, I think he needed that time to to really hone in his voice and his storytelling abilities. It's like the the, the prequel trilogy, it just he has so many good ideas. It's just, like, half of them are executed properly and the half of them are just kind of sprinkled throughout amidst, you know... Uh, negotiations over trade routes and all this other stuff that like rolling around in grass with Anakin and Padme and things like that. (laughs) And it's like, but, but the seeds for him turning to the dark side are there in those first two movies. It's Mm -hmm. him being too old and being brought into the Jedi council and already having an attachment with his mother and, and them kind of disapproving of him. So like the seeds for him to grow, to become resentful of the Jedi council is already there in that, like two scenes that he has in front yeah. of them, um, you know, losing his mother and the fear, and then how that attachment basically shifts from, even though it sounds kind of creepy, basically shifts from his mom to Padme, uh, <laughs> and, and how his fear of, of loss for her and that he's going to let her down, that he's not going to reach the potential, all the pressure that he's had put on him, being told from the age of nine that you're the chosen one, you're supposed to bring balance to the force, no pressure, but <laughs> yeah, and then um, and I, you know, then having Palpatine being this this older like fatherly figure basically guiding him the whole way and stroking his ego. And, and I don't think we get enough of that in the prequels. I think that we should have had a little more of that in, in uh, episode two. Um, yeah. I think there's one scene where he's like, Oh, I foresee you being the greatest of all Jedi. And that's basically all we get with, with their relationship, which ends up being the entire fulcrum for this film to really work yeah. uh, is understanding that, um, you know, he's been a confidant with Anakin for, what, 12, 13 years or so at this point, whatever it's supposed to be. And, mm. I, I, you know, having that backstory laid out a little bit more apparently throughout the trilogy would have, yeah. would have, I think, assuaged a lot of the criticisms towards this movie about Anakin's turn to the dark side. And, um, sure. you know, I, I agree with you, the fact that this is Anakin's movie, that helps this film feel like a, a, like a coherent narrative. Uh, as a, And... In the same way, I've heard the first one being compared to uh, being being referred to basically as Amidala's story, and in hmm. and in and yeah. I could I could kind of buy that, and, but that just I think underscores even more so why the second film maybe has the most narrative problems because it does feel so disjointed between Anakin's story and Obi Wan's story, and they can't figure out exactly who they want to focus on. And, yeah. and I feel like had the second film really realized that it really should have just focused on Obi-Wan's investigation and then had the uh, Anakin Padme thing and the Anakin Palpatine thing kind of playing out in the background, that would have that would have built uh, I don't know, that would have felt more uh, more of a piece than than just basically a bridge movie between episode one and episode three, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree with what you're saying about Anakin and Palpatine's relationship, because it is it is, you know, really the focal point of this movie. And I, I also have to slip slip in there, you know, like I really, really don't think we give, um, uh, what's his name, who plays um, Ian, Ian McDermott, McDermott yeah. enough credit for, uh, for, for Palpatine because, you know, I mean, people complain about the performances in the prequels, but this guy, he acts the hell out of this movie and chews every bit of scenery so effortlessly. I am I watching this movie again made him ex, made me excited to see him come back in Rise of Skywalker. I don't even care in what capacity. <laughs> like he just he knocks it out of the park in this movie. Anyway, side side tangent. But yeah, I mean like there his relationship with Anakin is really the focal point of this movie and I really I'm going back through Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones in my head trying to figure out, you know, like at what point did we see that? At what point did that even get introduced? And granted, it's been a while since I watched them, but I really can't think of anything. So I think I think if, I, I I would have loved if George Lucas would have figured that out sooner and planted that a bit more, so that the that that relationship would have just had a little bit more weight in this movie. But I think it works, and I I I think a lot of that is owed to the actors. So. Yeah, yeah, and and the fact that. Um, 
this film, I just wish this film had more ground to build off of with the previous two movies. But like taking this film mm-hmm. as its as uh, as its own individual story, I think it I think it works. Like no question. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the you know yeah. the progression isn't quite there. It's just like baby step, baby step, baby step, and oh giant leap forward in the storyline. You know. Yeah. Um, so so I guess we should try and just take this like segment by segment. So. Star Wars films obviously are, are references to old serials, Flash Gordon, things like that that inspired Lucas. So they're historically very episodic. And I think in this film is one of the more obvious examples of that, where the first 20, 25 minutes is just the rescue of Chancellor Palpatine from from Dooku and and all that. And I, I feel like I, I you get this is an important sequence because it establishes how the Anakin and Obi-Wan dynamic has changed, that they're more they're basically more brothers now than a f- kind of the father son dynamic we had in the last film. Uh, do, do you think this movie does enough of that of that legwork since it, it really is the most screen time that the two of them have together until the end of the film? Yeah, what I was I was really impressed watching this this opening sequence again because I think, you know, when we talk about the when when people in the Star Wars fandom talk about the storytelling deficiencies of the prequels, they're usually talking about how it was style over substance, you know, like the action scenes were spectacularly choreographed and and beautifully executed and then you had these dialogue scenes which which suck, quite frankly. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I remember thinking the last time I saw Phantom Menace just how phenomenal the pod racing sequence was as a feat of filmmaking. And then every single scene with Liam Neeson, like the top of his head is cut off because the shots are misframed. I, I, I remember being like very frustrated, like you were paying so much attention to this, but you weren't paying attention to this. And oh, by contrast, what I liked, what I liked about revisiting the, the rescue sequence from the beginning of Revenge of the Sith is I think it does a really, really solid job of balancing all of that human drama with all of the crazy space opera spectacle. Like, yeah, you do get a very, very solid grip on Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship at this point. What, when you're given very little of it, you know, like their, their interactions count for a lot. Um, and then that whole sequence with, you know, where he saves him from count Dooku and has to kill count Dooku, you know, it, it, it feels like a very natural and organic pause to that to that action sequence it's like you have all of this crazy nonsense going on and then things get really really quiet for like 10 seconds and it's really powerful you know i just think it's a very i think it's a very well executed sequence and i i was impressed going back you know with a better knowledge of filmmaking at at how well he's able to pull off i guess the first episode of this episode <laughs> if that's a thing <laughs> yeah it's, it basically is kind of its own like mini episode it's like each of the films you could basically break down to do what three or four extended sequences whether it's return of the jedi and it's jabba's palace endor and then the second death star or or this film where it's you know uh, the rescue of, of Palpatine and then kind of the, uh, I don't know, the slow burn of Anakin's turn to the dark side and then the midpoint yeah. where things really, which we'll get to, obviously. Um, but no, and I agree with you. I think uh, he, he, Lucas has always been, in many ways, a better director and then a writer. Uh, <laughs> then, mm-hmm. you know, which is why he's heard himself a lot. He's just said a lot about these films being kind of uh, almost silent films that John Williams score does a lot of the heavy lifting and yeah. uh, and he really doesn't like he doesn't he seems like a, a writer director that kind of hates writing and and doesn't and his strong suit is not necessarily working with actors it's just he he has to that's kind of the steps he has to get through in order to pull off the sequence yeah. but I, I think that you know the interplay between Anakin and Obi-Wan here you know they're 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 referencing the um, Obi-Wan's like being critical of R2 and, and Anakin's like defending him. They're referencing other missions they've been on and like kind of strategizing and things like that. And there was even more of that in the deleted scenes. There's a few deleted scenes that kind of take place in in that sequence. Uh, I think I think he, uh, he does accomplish a lot with very little to the point where after Anakin, after we get another of, of Anakin's steps towards the dark side, that, that being killing Dooku, and even though he was unarmed at that point and it's not the Jedi way, as he said, that he's still not willing to uh, to sacrifice Obi Wan. He's Palpatine is trying yeah. to get him like, oh, leave him or I'll never make it. Just trying to because he knows that Obi Wan is an obstacle in getting Anakin to turn, 
And so he's like, oh, this will save me some time. Just leave him behind. Let's get out of here. Uh, I, ha- yeah. I, have a, I have a job opening for you, Anakin. Um, <laughs> so No, it's clear character development. Yeah. It's like you see he's at this specific place at the start of the movie where he's willing to he's willing to go again. He's willing to break the rules and do things that he knows are wrong, but he still deeply cares about the people who he loves. And it's like that. And I, I think, you know, starting having that be really like the first plot beat of the movie is really smart because it gives us a very solid sense of where he's at going into the rest of the story. So yeah, it is, it's, it's funny. I, I agree with what you're saying about Lucas being more of a, of a director than he is a writer. But I also know that he, I think he brought in like Tom Stoppard to do like a dialogue pass on this movie. And it shows like the dialogue in this movie is, is it's still not, it does still doesn't have the flair of like Kasdan or anyone, mm-hmm. but it's like, it, it works, I think, you know, and like, you know, after that sequence, we go into really what amounts to a full half hour of just, talking and you know it's just it's like Anakin talking to the Jedi Council and all of this like political interplay between Palpatine and the Council and Anakin kind of getting stuck in the middle of that and it's like there's no it punctuated with no action sequences it is just like talking for a half hour and I I found it as an adult and as somebody who's a little bit more politically savvy really compelling that being said, though, it's not shot in a particularly interesting way. Every scene is just like them walking in the in the halls of the Jedi Temple. And it's like all of these. He does these like wide shots that are like slowly pushing in. And I I, I felt that it was like keyframing in post because there wasn't enough movement to keep it interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like he's gotten better at dialogue, but it's still not it's still not what interests him from a cinematic standpoint, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I, I think the, the opening sequence too, as we were saying about how um, the Anakin Palpatine relationship and how key it is to this film, right out, right out of the gate, you know, they, they reiterate uh, Anakin's past with Dooku or uh, Palpatine saying, Oh, he cut off your arm. You wanted revenge. Remember what you told me about the sand people. So again, we're getting references to the fact that he's been confiding him in everything that's been going on throughout this entire process. So it's like everything. It's just almost in a way you could almost just, tell someone, oh, this is the this is the world, this is what happened, and kind of just almost go into this film movie and it and it establishes everything you need to know, assuming that you haven't mm-hmm. like almost assuming that you hadn't seen the other films. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's that is a testament to the fact that that Lucas had a clear vision for for this movie. And uh, and I think that that's you know, this is probably where his writing shines the most. I mean you go to this movie where the, the politics and everything is very, very complex to the last film where it's he's bitching about sand and things like, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and that one had <laughs> yeah. a co-writer too, like a credited co-writer. So it's like, it's <laughs> oh, hard, yeah, it's right. hard to, it's hard for me to imagine that this is the same guy that created Jar Jar Binks is, is creating this uh, allegorical story about politics and how you know how a dictatorship can rise from a democracy and all this other stuff that's now eerily relevant uh well eerily relevant back then then like i i yeah like i was watching this is another another plus to watching this movie now that i'm older is like i watching this thing i was like wow George Lucas did not like Dick Cheney, (laughs) you know, like there is so much American politics in this movie, not to get political on a podcast about movies, but just the way, the way Palpatine uses the war to like rally support and power for himself Mm -hmm. felt very, very similar to the way that the, the, the government rallied power during the Iraq war, it was just, I don't know. It was, I know Lucas went on record after the fact saying like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean this to, to say anything about anyone specific, but you know, there is a lot in this movie that, you know, speaks to human truths and, you know, truths that are still relevant today. And, and I don't know. I mean, like there's some, there's some subtext in here and it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, like, especially having, I, you know, I watched vice last, last year, which I actually really didn't like that much, but as a movie, but mm-hmm. it was very educational and, and watching this now I'm like, Hmm, Hmm. I think, <laughs> I think Lucas had his ear to the ground. <laughs> um, but it's cool. I think that like, that's one of the things I really, really, really like about this movie is how, it's angry. It's an angry movie. It's an angry star Wars movie. And that's kind of, that's never, that's something we had never gotten up to that point. And it's still something I don't think people are open to nowadays. You know, I mean like last Jedi 
was a little bit weird and everybody got angry. So it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of ballsy in retrospect. It's, it's not, it's more than downbeat too. It's, it's like just straight up cynical at, at times. It's just like, ah, oh, yeah. what are we fighting for? What's the point of this? We're all going to lose. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and that's why it has to end with baby, you know, baby Luke and uh, Owen kind of looking at the sunrise. It's like, don't worry. There's more of these. There's It'll a new hope. Out. Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise you're just like, Jesus, this is like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, um, it's so heavy and being a, you know, being a star Wars fan and being invested in this world and then having it, having, having it turn. So in a way suddenly, and we'll get to order 66 in a little bit, um, Ooh, yeah. which is, you know, that hit me really hard seeing this uh, in my early twenties and, and, uh, you know, just the image of all these characters, you know, cause I, I my brother is, is uh, eight years younger than me. So he's in his late twenties. So we, mm. we, um, we had all the toys and all the, we knew the names of all the, the Jedi and all that. So I was like, Oh my God, oh, that must have hurt. That must have hurt. I was yeah. Sakura. I'm like, Oh geez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Plo Koon or whoever. Yeah. So, um, it, cause I'm going to, I'm going to make a bold statement here considering the, the final season, but this, the revenge of the Sith rewatching it really reminded me of game of Thrones on a good day. You know, like you had a lot of really devastating, shocking character deaths and all these, all these believable and even likable characters making dark, horrible decisions. You had all this really smart, savvy political intrigue. You know, I, it watching it, it felt a lot less like, you know, the, the, you know, punk space opera fun of the original trilogy and even the sequel trilogy and much more in line with like a George R. R. Martin book. And, and like I said, I really appreciate it for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, it is, it's really, it's really crazy. Like in retrospect, th- the things that this movie pulls off. Um, mm-hmm. So moving on, I guess from that opening sequence. So then we kind of get to the the resolution of the Clone Wars and uh, Anakin's seduction to the dark side, which kind of happened, uh, you know, simultaneously. What it, did you do? You think that it any it's any way. Uh, disappointing or, uns- or unsatisfying that we don't really see the meat of the Clone Wars. You get the beginning of it and the end of it. I guess that's why they have a TV series. But uh, <laughs> what is your, you know, what's your take on on the way that it's just bookended? To 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 reiterate, like the narratively, the whole point of the Clone Wars was for Palpatine to take power. Like that's why it all happened. That's why he was the Phantom Menace. Is he needed these wars to to gain the support and for everybody to turn against the Jedi and he needed it to go on for as long as it did. So it's like, I, I mean, I think we get enough of it in terms of like, cause that's the thing, right? It's star Wars. You have to have some star Wars in the movie or right. else it doesn't constitute a star Wars movie. Um, and I think we get enough. I mean, like the, the droids have always been, you know, a, kind of a dumb (laughs) or a really dumb antagonist, but in a fun way, like one of like one of my favorite things about this movie, which everybody kind of craps on, which, which is disappointing to me, but like, I really, really like general grievous, like general grievous. I was about to get to him. (laughs) I, I, here's the, like, I, I, I hate admitting this lot, like on an, on a podcast, but I have a, I, a life size cutout of general grievous that I got when I was a kid that is still in my house right now. (laughs) <laughs> um, I loved this character. I thought he was so cool. That moment where he like when his arms split apart and you find and he like turns on the four lightsabers mm-hmm. is, is very much akin to like Darth Maul. That one shot with Darth Maul where he turns on the one side of the lightsaber and then the other side lights up just in terms of like, oh, my gosh, no way. And I and I really like it with his character, too, because watching it watching it and paying attention to the storytelling this time around. Like he, he's set up to be this like total dweeb. Like he's just hunched over. He's coughing all the time. You know, he just, he sounds really old and grungy and you're just like, Oh, this guy, he's good. Obi-Wan's just going to go and mow down this guy in a second. And then all of a sudden he breaks out like two extra arms and is like crawling everywhere. And it's just a really, it's a really fun little bait and switch that I didn't notice when I was a kid because he was advertised that way in all of the toys, right. but, um, but it's clever and it's fun. And I think it, it's, it's very indicative of the, of the small pleasures of watching the clone wars play out, even in brief moments, you know, like George Lucas was really able to go to town on these, 
these really strange and funny and cool designs for all these different droids. And even though they were easy to beat, you know, again, like I said, that was never really the point. So you needed something to, you needed something to add this levity to the movies. It's weird. Like the, like the, in the original trilogy, the stormtroopers didn't exist to add levity to things. They were menacing, but it's like now in the prequels, the menacing aspects are the, are the big bad guys pulling the strings in the background while the ground level soldiers are there for comic relief. And it's, it's an interest. Like I said, it's um, like so many other things about the prequels. I thought, I thought it was a fun, interesting choice and I thought largely works very well. Even the battle droids in this movie are are slightly more entertaining because I, I, one, one moment that I think of a lot is um, when I, when I think of this film and the battle droids is uh, when Grievous captures Obi-Wan and Anakin and he takes the lightsabers for his collection and he's got a whole bunch of them obviously the battle droid yeah. takes the saber hands it to Grievous and he like swipes it from him and the guy's like you're welcome the little battle yeah. droid just walks away <laughs> like little things like that like yeah. they, it, it, even that like I feel like is even the battle droids and the way they, the, these films handle them I think is, is dialed up and kind of uh, honed in a little bit more um, mm-hmm. so what did you what do you think about Grievous who obviously is introduced in, in that opening sequence the fact that he is part alien part droid and kind of a in a way and I've, I've you know in the commentary I think for this film Lucas admits that it's he's basically supposed to be kind of a a proto Vader in a way like kind of uh, hinting at the the combination of uh, flesh and, 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 uh, you know, man and machine as Obi-Wan would say. Wow. I actually didn't think about it that way, that, that, that was kind of Palpatine's prototype for, (laughs) for what Vader would become. That's, that's an, that's an interesting, huh? Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, I always, to me, Grievous was always just the coolest toy you could ever buy. Um, and I was really content with him just being that for the movie. Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it's like you, you look at him in context with the rest of the star Wars universe and it's like, yeah, you have this half human, half droid thing. And it is, it is a clever act of foreshadowing. It is a clever, you know, looking ahead to what Darth Vader would become. And at the same time, Darth Vader is kind of like the better version of that. Right. He's, he's more powerful than general Grievous. He's scarier than general Grievous. He can use the force when general Grievous can't, you know, it's like uh, the prequels are interesting too, because you look at all of the, you, you look at all of Palpatine's different apprentices and you see them all, kind of getting mowed down, but they keep getting better and better. So it's like this slow build towards like the ultimate apprentice who right. is Darth Vader. It's another reason that I think we really needed. I think we really needed Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones because you needed to see Darth Maul as just this, like he's just raw brute force. And then Count Dooku's like this really smart, you know, he's really smart and educated. But, and, but he used to be a Jedi too, which is another, and he used to Anakin be, and he used thing, to be yeah. a Jedi. And then you have general Grievous and then you have Darth Vader who is literally a mix of all three of those characters. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, George Lucas always talks about in interviews and stuff about the star Wars movies being poems. And it is like, it's like a, it's like a limerick where you've got like three, three things that, that all rhyme with each other. So I, I never, but I never really thought about it that way. That's really interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, in, even in this movie, there's a lot of visual echoes specifically to return of the Jedi with the uh, Palpatine on the chair and the beating sequence and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. and Anakin with the, the dark robes on kind of like Luke has in return of the Jedi. All of a sudden he shows up, he's wearing black a lot and like, Oh, mm-hmm. what's this about? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So then that, uh, early on and, um, he comes back after rescuing Palpatine and uh, rescue after rescuing Chancellor Palpatine and, uh, discovers that Padme is pregnant. I, I do think one thing that I, I do, it's unfortunate in this film, is that Padme is really sidelined in a lot of it. Uh, I agree. She, <laughs> she has, you know, she's the leader in the first one, in episode one. In the second one, she's, you know, she may not be driving the narrative in the same way because she's being hunted, but she kicks more ass in the, in the uh, uh, execution arena than the other than two oh, Jedi yeah. she's she with. has to do some she's cool like, stuff in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. And then here, she's just like pregnant, being worried, looking off <laughs> off into the distance of the Jedi Temple, being oh, you know, yeah. hoping everything works out. Uh, and, and I think, you know, part of that is obviously narratively based. And then part of it is also because a lot of the, I don't know if, how familiar we are with the deleted scenes of this film, but there was basically a whole subplot 
keying up the creation of the Rebel Alliance that was going to involve Padme and uh, in uh, Bail Organa and, and kind of well, that's interesting. Cre- like she was going to be mm. instrumental in that. And I think the only real remnant of it that's in this film is when she's talking to Anakin and she's saying, "What if we're on the wrong side? What if the, the Republic that we, you know, that we're fighting to yeah. save doesn't exist anymore?" And that kind of thing, which isn't is another little interesting wrinkle huh. of this of this story that. Um, makes the politics that much more complex and also I think is one of the the building blocks towards Anakin's turn to the dark side because he does feel like he's being pulled in a million different directions by his wife, by the council, by Palpatine, by what he feels like he needs to do to, to, as the chosen one and his sense of responsibility. So um, I don't know. I <laughs> respond to that, I guess. Oh, uh, no, I, I agree. I, I'm... It's... Yeah, I... I it's hard watching one of my favorite parts of the prequels just kind of sit there pregnant right. and sad 90% of the time. That being said, another person who really does not get enough credit for these movies is Natalie Portman. Like I, you know, she's, she brings all of the, all of the longing and nuance to those romantic scenes that Hayden Christensen is obviously like <laughs> either, either uninterested in or not capable of. Like it's, it's funny. I, I was talking to, to Adam, my roommate after, after we watched the movie and we were, we were talking about the romance scenes in this movie. And every time it's a shot of Natalie Portman, right? She'll say a line and you can see, you could see the thoughts flash across her face. You can see all of this internal drama mm-hmm. and all of this struggle, you know, in her eyes. And, and even if what she's saying is a little bland, it's, and even if the shot itself is a little bland, she's giving it like 110%. And then you r- reverse shot to Hayden Christensen and it's like happy, <laughs> sad, <laughs> happy <laughs> sad <laughs> it's, it's it's frustrating because i think with a better or a better you a better utilized actor in that role i i think the romantic scenes in this movie could have really popped but i don't know that's just me. it's it's lucky that we only get really like and then that was what i was referring to when i said like the stink of the prequel of the other two films is that there's only two moments where their romance is really kind of i guess played up in that way and it's the um Oh, the so love has blinded you scene, which is the one part in this movie that I'm like, oh, why is this here? Yeah, and then yeah. uh, later on, when she's like, "Hold me by you, like you did by the uh, by the lake in Naboo," <laughs> like those couple of moments where I'm like, "Don't, don't, sh- don't remind me of that. Just, just, let's just move past that. You're worried about mm-hmm. Anakin, and uh, we un- let's just go past that." Um, <laughs> Weirdly, I, I just have to say because there is actually like one romance scene, if you can even call it that, in the entirety of the prequels that like. I really, really love, and I wrote it down in my notes and I'm going to, I'm going to hate myself if I forget to mention this, but it's that scene like right before everything goes to shit Mm -hmm. where Padme's in her apartment and Anakin's sitting alone in the Jedi chamber and you've got this mood music playing over this luscious sunset and they're just looking out at each other and it's, it's shot in such a way as to where it, 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 it makes them look like they're in the same room looking at each other, but they're not. And it just, Oh, it just really came to life for me in that moment. I remember seeing that when I was a kid too, and feeling this, this impending gloom and sadness from, from so little. And, and it's, and and it's frustrating because I watched that scene, which is, I think, one of the best scenes in this movie. And then I'm like, yeah, but why doesn't every one of their romance scenes feel like this? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't every one of their romance scenes work this well? And yeah, some of that's the dialogue. I do think some of it's Hayden Christensen. I just think that he's, I don't think he's a bad actor. I just think it was really not, you know, like there's Anakin's angsty. And I think there was just a, just too much angst in this, <laughs> in his performance and in Lucas's approach to this character. But, um, but I don't know. I mean, what did you think? What did you think of that scene? What did you think of Hayden Christensen? I mean, Hayden Christensen, uh, it, it, he's not really capable of selling the, the <laughs> complicated emotion. I think, like you said, I think what he's in like full on rage mode, I think he, he works as, as kind of goofy as lines like, uh, you know, to me, the Jedi are evil. Like a lot of the stuff during yeah, the, yeah. it's like, I understand it because this is point. Like, yeah, Obi Wan says he's lost. Um, but I, 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 to go back to what you were saying, that I really do also like that scene with the, with the two of them kind of sitting and, and like 
contemplate. It's actually Padme's Ruminations is the track on the soundtrack. And I remember listening mm, to that. Yeah. Um, because she's, you know, uncertain and worried about her baby, which she doesn't know his babies. And, uh, and he's trying to grapple with realizing that Palpatine is a Sith Lord and what he's going to do. And meanwhile, you can hear under the music, uh, Palpatine just being like, Oh, you need me to save her, blah, blah, blah. Like he's yeah, manipulating yeah, yeah. him like through the forest in that way. And, and then that's, I think one of two points uh, during that are instrumental in his turn to the dark side where uh, Anakin rolls a tear or a tear mm-hmm. or two. And I, I think, yeah, you know, we talked about this a little on the, on the last recording that we didn't I was able to save, but um, I think little moments like that are so critical to why his turn to the dark side is actually more believable than a lot of people give it credit for. And Oh who, yeah. 100%. Because this yeah. movie gets unfairly lumped in with the other two films, which we're, we've been consistently distancing it from throughout this conversation. <laughs> but, um, you know, because, because of, uh, how everything is orchestrated because how, uh, Palpatine is using Anakin as a, as a, basically a pawn to, to, uh, you know, poke and prod the Jedi council to react. And it's like, it's like a power struggle going on where Anakin's basically stuck in the middle. Um, and he's being groomed to be on Palpatine's side. So things like that, where he's like, he, he's just weighing everything in his head and realizing that the only clarity that he has in this complicated world, where even his, his best friend is asking him on behalf of the council to spy on, on the, one of his, you know, one of the only people that he feels like he trusts, uh, yeah. you know, he even, tr- he even tries to go through the, the conventional channels when he's worried about Padme and he goes to Yoda and Yoda tells him to, to let go of everything he fears to lose, which Anakin's not capable of doing obviously at this point. And it's like all the, all the pieces are there for him so that when he makes that decision to, to show up, it's not even cause he's going there. Um, he's not even going to Palpatine's office to kill or stop Mace Windu. He's just like, Hey, I need to make sure this goes the way I need it to. Cause I need this. I need him. He says in that point. So yeah. how, what are your thoughts on the way that the, the seduction to the dark side is played out, which is, as you, as you referenced earlier, basically 30 to 40 something minutes of Anakin being pissed about this and then pissed about this. And then like everything, like the, all the pieces kind of lining up for that to happen. I'm going to make a, I'm going to do a star Wars sin and I'm going to reference last Jedi. Um, because one of my favorite moments in that movie is when, when Ray is talking to Luke and Luke says like, you know, you know, at the height of their, it's like at the height of their power, you know, the Jedi allowed Darth Sidious to take power and practically got themselves killed off. And, and I remember being in the theater for the first time and watching that and being like, wow, the prequels are just as much about, the folly of the Jedi yep. as they are about Anakin falling to the dark side. Like what, what I, what I like about what I like about the Re- revenge of the Sith is the nuance with which I think Lucas approached this character's downfall. Like it is Anakin very much makes the choice to turn to the dark side, become Darth Vader and kill children. Like that is his choice, you know? And, and, and like we said, I think that choice really makes sense. Um, you know, I, another, another thing about the sequels is I think, you know, Kylo Ren as both a character and a performance by Adam driver has really put, Anakin in these movies into context like we were all very frustrated by Hayden Christensen's m- moody angstiness and and I watch Adam Driver's performance in the sequels and I'm like oh no yep that's yep <laughs> it skipped a generation but yep that there it is so, um, so I think you know his character and his turn to the dark side really makes sense because you do see him being pulled in all these different directions but I think it is the prequels are also a about the fall of the Jedi and about, you know, inadvertently the role that they played in their own destruction. Like I, you know, I think back to, again, I don't remember a whole lot of Phantom Menace, but I remember that one scene where Qui-Gon who has been telling Anakin this whole time, like you're going to be a Jedi and I see potential in you and this and that. And he takes him back to Coruscant and they bring him in front of the Jedi council. And this little kid stands there in front of all these grown men who in front of him collectively go, nah, (laughs) not good enough. (laughs) Nah, you know, no. And specifically you're not good enough because you love your mother. I mean, that's toxic. I mean, like that's really toxic. Like what that does to a person like Anakin is like, 
Anakin isn't just stressed and pulled in so many directions. Like he's repressed. And what I, what I've liked about the, (laughs) what I've liked about the star Wars movies since then is they've really put into context just how messed up some of the Jedi ideology is when you think about it, Mm -hmm. like it is a religion and it bears with it a lot of the problems that people have with religion and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the repression that comes with like trying to be a perfect version of yourself right. for the Jedi or for God or whoever. And I, and, and I like that this movie plays with that, you know, like that scene where Yoda tells him to just basically like, you know, turn it off. <laughs> um, it, it, it sucks because it's like, no Yoda, you're like, like, help him through this. Like he's dealing with like actual emotions. And instead the Jedi are like, no, you cannot <laughs> just push experience those down. Love. <laughs> yeah. Just push those down. It's like, it's, it's almost like the, the prequels are just a big metaphor for gay conversion therapy. It's like, <laughs> and so you look at like the Jedi and their fall and, and, and how Anakin brings them down. And I think they, you know, I think they share a lot of that responsibility and I, I don't know. I mean, how to, how, what do you think of that? I don't, I haven't really seen that explored too, too much in, in the, in the magical world of star Wars thick pieces. But, but I think it's an element of this movie that gets, that doesn't get talked about a whole lot. The, the religion, uh, part of it. Well, just, just how, just how, how the, the Jedi, Jedi are how, how it is and, also yeah. a trick. Yeah. How the Jedi are complicit in that, how it is just as much a tragedy about Anakin as it is about them. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I, that's why I love, I'm glad you mentioned that scene in the last Jedi. Cause that was for me, one of the, one of the, one of the, a leap forward for the sequel trilogy to really reckon with the, the, the everything that's come, bef- come before to really put things in a better context. And for the, the Star Wars saga to be kind of, reach a, a level of self-awareness that it hasn't really ever gotten yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, the fact that the the Jedi are mired in this arrogance and um, and just assuming that, you know, there's there's references in uh, the Latin episode two, they, and I talked about this on that episode, that where, they're, you know, Padme comes to them, it's like, I think Count Dooku is the one trying to kill me. And then Mace Windu is like, nah, it could have been him. He used to be a Jedi. It's not in his character. <laughs> like, I don't think the four, I don't, and then they say in episode one, I don't think the, the Sith could have returned. It's always Mace Windu, by the way, which is, you know, feels fitting considering what happens in this movie. Um, <laughs> he's like, I don't think the Sith could have returned without us knowing. I'm like, really? You don't want to look into it? Maybe, you know, find out what's going yeah. on? Why is there and a red lightsaber? Yeah. It's literally a red flag. That's the Sith. I mean, that's the only one. <laughs> it's a red lightsaber. It's a red flag. Exactly. No, but it's like they they fall. You're right too. Like they fall right into Palpatine's trap. Like he's able to execute Order sixty six because he set it up in such a way to make it look like they were trying to kill him yes. to gain power and, and, and how the movie finds some level of truth in that, you know, that this is, this is the, like the Jedi are toying with this idea of like, maybe it would just be better if we just took control of this situation, you know, and, and, and that temptation and how that manifests in their actions and stuff and how Palpatine is able to use that against them. Like it is, it's a tragedy. It's a, tra- it's, it's as much related to their problems as it is to problems completely out of their control. And you wonder also not to, again, not to get too political, but with this movie, it's kind of unavoidable. You it wonder is, yeah. in the star Wars universe, when he goes up and we're kind of skipping past order 66, which we'll get to in a second, when he goes yeah. in front of the Senate and he's like, Oh, the attempt on my life has left me scarred and deformed. You know, yeah. talking about how they tried to take over, detailing a plot by the Jedi to take over the, the Republic. You wonder how many people in those Senate boxes is are, are, are actually buying that story and how many yeah. are like, uh, I don't know. But as we've seen now, there are certain levels of truth that people would just be like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. We'll let that be. <laughs> we'll accept it as is because it's not worth fighting it. It's just, you know, exactly. let's let it, let it happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this, you know, the movie really delves into the, the dissection of the the moral question between the Jedi and the Sith. I mean, uh, Palpatine brings it up at the, in the opera scene, talking about what good is a point of view, and and about how, in a lot of ways, the Jedi and the Sith aren't that uh, you know that different on the, on their just their ideology part of it. Yeah, and it makes me wonder, and I brought this up again and again during this kind of revisiting of the films, is that it makes me wonder how that question of balance will be addressed in the rise of Skywalker. If there Mm -hmm. will not be Jedi and Sith, it will just be, you know, force users that don't fall into one extreme or the other, that the balance really Ray is kind of finding the balance by being, well, I, I use the, I'm, I'm, you know, use the force for good, but I also don't like repress my emotions. I channel it in, in a, in a positive way as opposed to, 
<laughs> you know, no attachment is forbidden. Like, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. Well, it is, it is why, I mean, I know we're talking about revenge of the Sith, but, but it is why I love the sequel so much is because I do think that it is an answer to that question that the prequels pose, which is that, that idea that like is good versus evil. Like, is that really what this is? Like, is this really what it is? It's, it's a cycle. It's a, it's a, it's a wheel that keeps perpetuating itself. And that's why you have like the first order, which looks exactly like the empire and does the same shit as the empire is because, you know, if you can't find a balance between that, you're always going to have this, this struggle for power. And I think, you know, l- like looking at revenge of the Sith in context with the rest of the star Wars movies, you really see just how, you know, the evil in the movie isn't even necessarily evil itself. It is that struggle for power. It is, you know, Anakin fighting to, you know, save the ones he loves, even if it means hurting people who he doesn't, you know, it's like it, 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 this movie lives in that moral gray area, which I think makes for really compelling drama. You know, it's, it, it, it really deepens the, it really deepens the moral and emotional stakes of the series in a way that like nothing in the original trilogy ever really could because it was a classic story of good versus evil. But yeah, I mean like now, now the movies are in the space where they are asking like, you know, wait, the Jedi kind of messed up and wait, the Sith kind of had kind of have a point and wait a minute. Like, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we fighting? You know, and I, and, and dealing with, all of those wars and all those battles that have come before. So it's like, I, like I said, like I said, in, in regards to Hayden Christensen's performance and the whole thing with how the Jedi are viewed, like, I really think these new crop of star Wars movies have put into context, these movies, which people were willing to pass off when they came out as garbage for kids, you know? So, yeah. um, which I, I like, you know, I, 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 I like the life that they've given them and, and continue to give them. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. So, um, leading into, uh, well, order 66, I guess we should get to oh. the, 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 the moment where he turns, uh, you know, the, the fact that the, um, the, the lightsaber battle. So obviously Mace Windu, uh, was it? I forget who some of the other people now. Plo Koon is there and uh, Kit Fisto. A I can't other pretend to know anyone's <laughs> I names. I somehow I like remember <laughs> a lot of them. I told you. That's why when they when they die in this movie, I'm just like, not that guy. I have the. I probably the could. When I was like 11, I could probably remember oh, all well, the names. I can't now. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks for your judgment, Jackson. 35. No, no, I, I, I'm like, I, I'm glad you can because now I'm like, oh, it's those guys. Yeah, no, I, yeah, <laughs> I just know Maze Windu. So. Well, that, and that's a different, that's the level of emotional investment that like hardcore Star Wars fans would have in these films rather than people who just watched them for fun. It'd be like, oh, Casually. okay, I don't know who that is, whatever. And that makes Order 66 but, all yeah, the more devastating. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. they come in, we get that great moment where, they're, you're under arrest, Chancellor, and he comes out with the lightsaber, and I am the Senate, and all that good stuff. Uh, <laughs> aside from the fact that the CG there to make Ian McDiarmid lightsaber fight is not not so good, I don't even really think it was so good at the time. It looked kind of goofy, just like the yeah. way his the way his face is like floating on it on his shoulders <laughs> because of the face replacement <laughs> that they did there or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so aside from all of that, I, I really like the 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 big the big confrontation moment with Mace Windu having him down with the lightsaber and Anakin has to uh, intervene. And I like the hypocrisy between him being like, Oh, you can't, you know, you know, we have to, he must stand trial. It's not, you know, it's not the Jedi way. Meanwhile, about an hour ago, he had no problem killing Do- Count Dooku, even though it wasn't the Jedi exactly. way. So yeah, there's that yeah, hypocrisy yeah, yeah. already kind of coming into fruition. Uh, there was, Famously, Sam Jackson said that he knew he was going to die in this movie, but he just didn't want to, you know, basically wanted to have a, uh, um, basically not go out like a punk. Basically, I think was his paraphrasing <laughs> his word. And and you know, to the to his to his credit, he's Sam Jackson, and he doesn't want to just get killed in a in a montage like so many other Jedi. And like I said, with yeah. uh, Mace Windu's role in this trilogy, he has been basically the the, uh, <laughs> the disapproving figure for uh, Anakin throughout a lot of his inter- interactions with the the Jedi Council. Uh, what do you think about the way that they handled Mace Windu's uh, death, Anakin's turn, and that that pivotal moment where even now, every time I watch it, I'm like hoping it's going to play out differently because what happens afterwards is so devastating. Yeah. And even though I, I know that obviously it's inevitably going to go the same way. 
Oh yeah. I, well, I like that you had a character. I like that you had a character in this series who really represented the Jedi. And I think that's really what Mace Windu was. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like he, he was a stand in for the Jedi as an institution. And, you know, he followed all the rules that they followed. And he, like we said earlier, you know, fell into a lot of the traps that they fell into, you know, and I think he represented a lot. He represented Anakin's relation hostile relationship with them. Um, so, so I like that again, like it's, it is good writing. Like I thought, I thought it was really smart to have Anakin's Anakin's turn to the dark side really happen when he killed not just a Jedi, but the capital T Jedi, you know, like he, you know, like Mace Windu's death really kicks off the, that, that montage in a, in a powerful way, because he's a character who up to that point, even though we've seen, uh, you know, we haven't really gotten into his head, you know, we understand like this guy, this guy knows what's up. Like this is the guy, you know? (laughs) Um, and, and Sam Jackson obviously owns that. I mean, this guy is the the king of being a total badass. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's, it's a sad, it's a, it's, it's a sad, powerful scene and I think it really works. And and I'm really glad that they didn't relegate him to getting killed off in that montage just with everybody else. Because I think, you know, I think he represented a, yeah, I think he, he represented a lot of what the Jedi stood for. And it was like, after that, it was, it's just all downhill from there. Yeah. He's, he's emblematic of the Jedi, uh, the Jedi council and what they represent. And it's basically in a nutshell, his betrayal of that, his rejection of that entire institution and ideology as you were saying so uh mm-hmm. no i agree and i love the the well i love that palpatine plays off that he's all weak and then has the unlimited power thing do, <laughs> do you you agree that i don't know if it's ever been 100 percent confirmed in canon that his face got that way because of the lightning reflecting back onto him right because i know there's some people that oh, are like oh yeah. that was his true form or he's a changeling or something like i didn't oh. ever read that ever but okay oh really yeah that, that's oh yeah no i just assumed i just assumed because he was having the lightning shot that's back on him so that that's what right i mean that's have to make that's yeah. right right I, like I, I, always, I that's what i always thought Wow. I, I didn't know there were other, debate, I'm yeah. learning so much in this <laughs> podcast right now. I had no idea that that was even a, that, that was even a question. I mean, that is actually kind of an interesting idea that, that those were his true colors. Well, he <laughs> it's, definitely, like a, it's like a disguise falling off as opposed to like him actually getting scarred. That's actually kind of an interesting, Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I'd almost buy that, but, but it's filmed in such a way to make it look like now he's getting electrocuted think, and that's what happens when you're getting electrocuted. I, <laughs> I think Lucas might mean it to almost be like symbolic in that way. Because, it is symbolic. Yeah, yeah because yeah. he does. I mean, he does have the he, two voices that he switch shifts through. I mean, there's very mm. clearly in early in the movie, there's very clearly a shift into the Sidious voice. was like, do it. And all of that uh, with Dooku. So I like that. uh, I I love that he he has Vader's name ready to go. Like he's like, you shall be known as Darth Vader. He had he had everything queued up because he's again playing everything to this moment. Like like you know, it makes me think of um, this is a weird comparison, but it makes me think of like if I try and take a panoramic photo with my phone. And you're like lining it up just perfectly. You have to shift it and stay right on that center. And like the whole first half of this movie, you can you can see Palpatine just making sure that everything is just lined up just so, so that when Anakin gets to this moment, he makes his this decision, um, yeah. and that he's been oh, yeah. orchestrating it like like with a fine tooth comb for for decades, getting himself elected senator and chancellor, blah 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 blah, yeah. to get to this point. And, and I love that when it happens, it does like the music kicks in and his voice is, is modulated, uh, uh, like kind of distorted in that scene where he's like to cheat death, and he like he 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 sounds otherworldly. Uh, just in that one, mm-hmm. that's, that's the only scene in the movie where he has that that his voice has that certain kind of distortion to it. Um, yeah, and that right away he, he he basically reveals that he hoodwinked Anakin. He's like, "Oh, to cheat death, only one has discovered." But you know, together we'll figure it out. It's like, dude, that's not what you told me. You said I <laughs> yep. could save your wife. Now you're like, eh, maybe I don't know. Let's find yeah. out. <laughs> but but at that point, it doesn't really matter because what the hell is Anakin supposed to do? I mean, the, yeah. he's he's bought into it. He's just, and I think Hayden Christensen really sells that moment very really well by falling on his knees. He's like, "Just help me save Padme's life. I'll do anything that you yeah. ask." Because it's like there's the sense of desperation that it, you know, 
I um, I sort of started to, to mention this when we recorded last time, and I never got to it, but now I can kind of get to it here. Is, is it kind of feels to me almost like someone, anyone that 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 acts in a, in a in a like a crime of passion, you you don't like you know rationally that what you did is wrong, but your your mind kind of you kind of do almost do these like mental gymnastics to find a way to justify it. Yeah. To, to where to me, I feel like at a certain point some part of him really believes that the Jedi were trying to take over, even though he knows that's not yeah. what it is, because that's the truth that he has to cling to because otherwise he's a monster. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's, it's real. I'm really, really glad you brought this up because this is another one of the points that I really wanted to talk about because it, it's a problem that a lot of people have with this movie is they're like, Oh, well, Anakin, how does Anakin go from like just being a normal Jedi to literally killing children so fast? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you underestimate just how, how traumatic I think killing Mace Windu is for him. Like he's like, I think he, in that moment, like he, he has to, he just accepts that like, Oh, well I'm the bad guy now. You know, it's like this, it's this, I, I I think you hit the nail on the head with mental gymnastics. It's like once you've, once you've gone, once you've made a decision like that, once you've made a decision that brash, it's like, do you just roll back on it? Do you just say like, Oh no, that wasn't me. Or, Oh, I had a moment of passion. Or do you like, do you just in a way like accept your fate? So it's like, it's, it's, it's depressing to think that he does go on to kill children so fast, but in a, in a very sad way, it's kind of believable. Like Mm -hmm. I, you know, this, like he's at that point, you know, he is, you know, he is truly lost. And the only person who is seeing any value in him at that moment is Palpatine, you know? And I think, you know, him going off and doing all these terrible things is, is, is less out of a sense of like, Oh, I want to go off and kill children and more of like, well, I guess I'm the guy who kills children now, (laughs) you know? And it's, 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 that's sad, but it felt very, unfortunately felt I, in my opinion, very psychologically astute. I don't know. What did you think of that? I I also think that it's, it's very purposeful in a way. Obviously Palpatine wants to knock off as many Jedi as he can before they figure out what's going on. Um, which he, you know, he outright states, but I also think it feels intentional for him to send Anakin on one of the, the most horrific version of taking out Jedi at that moment yeah. because he is in a state of shock and he will pretty much, it's like kind of almost testing his loyalty. It's like, all right, you're going to be a Sith. All right, this is what let's we're jumping right into the deep end. Go for it. Yeah. And if you yeah. do this, then I own your ass. <laughs> if not, then yeah. yeah, maybe I'll need another apprentice. We'll see what happens. But well, it's, it's again, like not to get political again, but you think about like, you know, the Nazis yeah. and all of these like quote unquote normal German people who are able to, who are capable of like, committing these atrocities and it's like in interviews with them afterwards they were like oh i was just following orders right you know it's like oh well this is just who i was this is who people said i was and therefore i was behaving in a way that acted in accordance with that it's it's scary human psychology but i i i I appreciated that the movie was able to go to those dark places i mean like we mentioned like earlier when we when we started the podcast that this is like a dark movie you know it's like when i when i watched this when i was a kid this was my first exposure to both sex and death. Cause, cause of course I left the theater and asked like, mom, how did Padme get pregnant? You know, <laughs> and I had, they had to have that talk, right. you know, but it's also like, you know, he kills children. We don't see it, but the fact that we don't see it is almost even more violent. I don't know. Like at what age are you comfortable showing this movie to your children? Yeah. Uh, well, when you saw it about what, 10 or so? Yeah, I, I, I was 10. Pro- that would probably it, be so. the absolute youngest. I would show this to yeah. like, just because, you know, just because it is a heroic figure taking a com- completely dark path. And it feels to me in stark contrast that earlier in the movie, he learns he's going to be a father. He's like, this is the happiest moment of my life. Fast forward like an hour. He's like, master Skywalker. <laughs> What are we going to do? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's like, it forces you to have those conversations. Yeah. It's like now, and now it's like you're, con- it, it was easy in other star Wars movies. When a, when an X wing got shot down, you were like, you didn't really have an attachment to the person right. inside it. And now it's like, you're actually thinking about death and, and, and what that means. And, um, but I think the movie handles it very tactfully. Like I think that the, to, to, to move on to that order 66 sequence, you know, I think it's, it's handled with a, with a reverence that, that really helps you walks you through the emotional impact of it, you know, down to like Yoda dropping the cane and like gripping his head and like total devastation, you know, 
Like they, they, they allow you to feel the weight of it. It's, you know, you, you realize in this film that it's the equivalent of like Satan or Hitler or whatever, taking over the universe basically. Yeah. And, and that in and of itself is, is harrowing enough. No, realizing that he's in charge of everything. But then when you find out which, which wisely was not really revealed in anywhere, they didn't hint at anything that the clone troopers Part of their, like a core part of their programming was uh, when the time is right, uh, kill all the Jedi. That's, that's, that's yeah. your, like, that on the DL, that's your mission. They're your generals Oof. until I hit a switch. And then guess what? Everybody, that's like, it's like all of a sudden to me, and this is probably why it, it, it affected me so much watching, especially the first time. It's like, who would, who do we consider the, the week that protect us now? I guess police, firemen. Yeah. Uh, all of our military, it's like someone flipped a switch and all of them were just going around killing people. Like it's like all mass hysteria, cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria, different movie. But, um, yeah, (laughs) it's like, it's like all of a sudden everyone you felt like you could trust and you could rely on their only mission was to take you out. And that to me, like, that's a really, a really hard real world analog to, to grapple with in a star Wars film. Yeah. Whew. This is a political podcast. <laughs> well, this one is kind of unavoidable. <laughs> it is. It is unavoidable, and I and I like it. And again, like I like the movie for that reason. So, um, you know, what do you what do you think about the kind of that read of of, uh, of the sequence and the way that it's handled out uh, or carried out uh, in large part, really kind of buoyed by John Williams' brilliant score. Yeah, I, I I like what you said said about how so much of the devastation really comes from the the trust that the jedi placed in the clones like you can you can see that these they they were treating these these clone troopers like like fellow soldiers in a battle it was like no they were of course they weren't expecting them to turn their guns on them like these are the guys i'm fighting with these are the guys who are fighting for me and it's like it's it's like it's it's just, yeah it's like that sequence isn't sad i mean it is sad because you're seeing a bunch of jedi get killed off and it's especially sad if you know all their names <laughs> but it's like it's sad because you you feel that sense of betrayal you feel you, you feel that sense of being you know somebody you thought you trusted turning against you. So, um, which I think is like, it, 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 you know, it, it, it's a really all, it's also like a very powerful lead into the Anakin Obi-Wan conflict, which ends up being the climax of the movie, because it's like, you feel this sense of like, like, Oh, you stabbed me in the back. It's, it's not even that I'm dead. It's that I'm like, it's that you hurt me. And it's like, it makes that, Oh, it just makes that like, I, I, I know you mentioned earlier that the, the whole Mustafar sequence is very cartoony. It is. It's also really good. Yeah, it like, is. I, I like that whole lightsaber fight sequence is just, it, it, you know, nowadays they would have actually made it look like a real volcano, but the, 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 uh, it, it, the grandness and scale of it adds a level of opera to it that, <laughs> that I think really heightens the drama. You know, this, this movie really puts the opera back in space. Opera. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and the emotions are running very high in that sequence. So, and that leads right into, well, some, well, just to throw that out there, that leads into some of my favorite Yoda moments. One, that he senses the clone trooper sneaking up on him and, oh, and right. decapitates yeah, yeah, both yeah, of them yeah, yeah. in an instant because it's fucking Yoda. And then, <laughs> and then two, the way he climbs on, I think it's Chewbacca's arm and like <laughs> crawls up. You're like, oh, he's so badass and cute at the same time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah I, love, love, I love Yoda in this movie. Yeah, yeah. This is Yoda's, I mean, with exception of obviously Empire, this is Yoda's finest hour uh, for yeah. sure. Uh, and then it really just becomes, I guess, back and forth of Anakin taking care of business uh, with the, with the Jedi, and then with the um, basically all the other villains from, from the previous movies, the the Trade Federation, and all the other people that, and the Separatists, uh, as well as Obi Wan kind of coming to grips with uh, with what's happened. You know, we get that one that farewell with the two of them when Obi-Wan's going to, to fight Grievous. And, uh, and then when he returns, it's, it's not Anakin anymore, pretty much. And I think that yeah. makes in subsequent viewings, it's always made that scene feel like really bittersweet because you, this is the last time really that Obi-Wan sees his friend. Yeah. Ugh. 
<laughs> I was I, I remember I watched this um with, with Adam my roommate and and we when we were we watching we were rewatching it together and you know we were like oh General Grievous and then like all of the all of that that fun sequence at the beginning of the movie and then like and then after after the all of this happens he's just like man I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs> it's just like so it's so heavy but um um but yeah it's you know I one of the most emotional moments in the movie for me that really like hit me in a way that I really wasn't expecting is it's, it's when Obi-Wan it's actually like at the end of the Obi-Wan. I know we haven't quite gotten there yet, mm-hmm. but it's like at the end of the Obi-Wan fight sequence with, with Anakin on Mustafar where he's like, I loved you, Anakin. You were my and brother. I, and I remember, yeah. yeah, but it was like, it was like the, I loved you bit that really got me because I was like, wait a minute, aren't the Jedi not supposed to like, love and it was like this really powerful moment where I was like oh my gosh he was going through this too and he was dealing with these emotions too and it's like oh gosh this <laughs> it's it's sad but it's good it's it's a really oof. This, is, this episode is getting kind of heavy because the, mo- the is, movie is kind of yeah, heavy I mean and, and is, you know yeah. kind of playing off what you were saying what we were saying about the clone the clone troopers and how they they turned on the Jedi and it's like that ultimate be- ultimate betrayal ultimate betrayal. They said ultimate. I don't know what I just said. The ultimate betrayal <laughs> is that it, it kind of feels in a way like George Lucas is kind of playing that trick on us. We've been lulled into like this false sense of security. Like, Oh, the clones yeah. are cool, whatever. And then all of a sudden like, yeah. Oh shit, the tables have turned. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, I, uh, I think that makes that really like it, it, it feels like, it feels like, you know, this is chronologically the sixth Star Wars film released. No, we've never seen anything like this happen in all six of those movies. So it feels like in a way, even though we know this is a prequel, we know that it's going to work out ultimately, um, that it, it feels like the Star Wars universe is kind of crashing down around you at the, at that point. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. the fact that it's led by Anakin and we get him storming into the, uh, the castle, uh, the, the Jedi temple with the, with the clone troopers, with the, the Imperial army, basically at this point, uh, I, I really, I really think you get like a lot of stark visuals uh, there with that, and as well as, you know, we knew that that we knew that at some point Anakin was going to turn to the dark side and Palpatine was going to ascend. But then you get like this entire sort of immediate aftermath of Obi Wan and Yoda realizing, hey, we're we're still around. <laughs> we we should probably yeah. figure out what's going on, and then it becomes a side mission of them going to the Jedi Temple. To change the uh, to change the the signal to tell Jedi to stay away, go into hiding because they're gonna you know they're mm-hmm. gonna kill you if you come back. Uh, how did you what, how did you feel about the way that that really gave us our first proper team up of Obi Wan and and Yoda and the way that they were you know trying to I guess do damage control at that point. Yeah, I I, I liked what you said about um, <clears throat> just to jump back to what you were saying earlier about like being lulled into it like so much of the like. I, I think back to the amount of filler that th- that is in the prequels and all of the nonsense with the battle droids and all of the all of the nonsense period that is most of episode one and it is almost like it almost feels intentional like it almost feels like Lucas like you know lulling us to sleep with all of this cool fun low stakes imagery only to like snap it back into sharp focus with, with all of, with this mass killing. So, um, in regards to the Obi-Wan Yoda stuff. Yeah. I, one one of my favorite points in them in this movie, which actually I'm kind of bummed. Never, never, um, <laughs> nothing ever came to fruition with it, but it's, it's when it's when Yoda's talking to Obi-Wan at the end and he's, he's telling him about training with Qui-Gon mm-hmm. later. Um, you know, I, I, I just really liked seeing, you know, I really liked the sense of the, the, the sense of camaraderie that they had. And it really, I think speaks to Frank Oz's performance that he's able to emote so well with, <laughs> with human actors, despite not even being a puppet this time, just being a CG character, right. you know, like, um, and that's also a testament to Ewan McGregor. Like, I think, I think another person who really doesn't get enough credit with these movies is him. Like his, his Obi-Wan is not only just a, a, a spot on Alec Guinness impersonation, but also like a really, fully formed character in his own right. Um, and, and yeah, that, that realization when they're in the temple and he sees Anakin killing all the Jedi is like, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's pure shock. And it, it just, it's, he does such a good job with it. I'm always kind of torn between who's the MVP of this movie. And it's always Ian McDiarmid or Ewan McGregor, because 
I, yeah. I think the, you know I loved him in episode uh, episode one his Obi Wan is like eh, whatever but in episode two he he really shows what he could do with that character and I think it really crystallizes here um, you know leading directly into Alec Guinness in, in the next chronologically the next film uh, which is why every time I see any kind of story about will he come back for this movie in a cameo or a TV show or an Obi Wan spinoff I'm like yes please give me this already yeah so, <laughs> give me Qui Gon again yeah, uh, <laughs> you know yes that's why I was like when that happened at the end of that movie i was like were they like setting that up to like be something i think they <laughs> like, were gonna have at least a cameo for for liam neeson or something and then it just didn't happen for whatever reason i, I don't i don't even think they shot it honestly well see that's the that's the benefit of making more star wars but on the is that you can true. do these that's things <laughs> kathleen kennedy i so, hope you're listening make it happen yeah, Disney yeah plus please, you need yeah. content do something with any of that that's true um yeah. well didn't they say there was an obi-wan movie like in development or something like, yeah or, something so we'll but. see it hasn't been a, like uh, official yet but I, if you look at the deleted scenes on the dvd um for this film there's that there that moment where um yoda's like they're on whatever moon they're on uh waiting for obi-wan to reach out to them they have padme and everything or oh no they don't have padme yet. it's yoda and out and bail and bail organa and he's like looking meditating and then bail organa comes in and says obi-wan kenobi has made contact um there is actually like a temp voiceover put in uh over that footage of yoda meditating that is supposed to be qui-gon kind of connecting with Yoda and things like that. So that's like the closest oh. that they got to actually putting anything in the movie. Um, but yeah, I don't think they ever shot anything with Liam Neeson. That would have been, that would have been cool. Cause that's one of the, it feels like that's a, an element of the star Wars universe that could still be fleshed out in the way that rogue one, uh, kind of retconned the fact that, Oh yeah, it's really easy to destroy this thing because it was put in there on purpose by the guy that designed it against as well. Yeah, like yeah, things like yeah. that, that feels like that's an element that is, we just assume like, okay, they, they die and they do join the force. I'm like, but that wasn't always the case that people get killed in these other movies and you don't, you know, that's never happened up to that point. So, um, I'd like to, yeah, I think that would be interesting too for them to explore in an Obi-Wan film, for example, if he's on Tatooine and we see a little bit of him get into like some, uh, some side adventure that, that delves into some of that, uh, some of that material a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I hope you're listening, Kathy. <laughs> this is what we want. Not that I mean, I I will take literally anything Star yeah, Wars. Of I'm like, it's I like I. Everybody was like, Solo was so unnecessary. I was like, I know, but it was also really cool. <laughs> so I I don't care. Like you could give me anything, and I would probably like it. Um, but but that would definitely be interesting. And also because like you know, listening to your episode one podcast, um, I know we're like going off topic here, but like you know, we there was so much about Qui Gon's character that I had f- just like forgotten you know Mm -hmm. and like really interesting stuff with his character that i'm like wow that's kind of like really interesting fodder for a movie or a tv show or just something you know i mean liam neeson's still around so (laughs) um balls in your court but yeah he's a well the fact that he was a kind of a rogue jedi who could have been on the council but was like yeah i'm not really into all of that like group stuff i just do my own thing over here I'll, I'll train people even if they, whether they approve or not, I don't give a shit. I, I play by my own rules. He's one of those kinds of guys. He's like the kid in like a high school movie from the eighties, like smoking a cigarette. Like ah, I just play by my own rules. That's yeah. Well, and it's also like, it's like I, I had always kind of like underestimated how important he was right. to these movies. And it's, you see so much of him in Anakin, Yeah, you know, like you see so much of that in Anakin of like, ah, I know the Jedi do this, but I'm going to do this because I think this is right, you know, right. it, it, to a much more drastic degree. But, you know, that mentality nonetheless. And, so. and it makes you wonder how different Anakin would have turned out if he had that guy who's Oof. who is yeah. b- bending the rules all the time versus by the yeah. book Obi-Wan, who's like, well, this is what the council said. This is what we should do. And like, you know. Yeah. And it's like it. But that's why I love like that fight sequence with with Obi and all of the stuff with Obi-Wan in the back half of this movie, because it's like you see the you see not only the anger and frustration with Anakin, but you see this like oh man, I wasn't good enough or I wasn't there for him and I didn't. And it's like, it's a very nuanced performance. And I think, I think the movie handles it very well. I failed you, Anakin. I have failed you as he says. Exactly. And and then, you know, you get to the point that obviously he was attached to Anakin. And then there's that other revelation involving Obi-Wan where he goes to see Padme and he's looking for, um, 
I'm looking for Anakin, obviously, because, because him and Yoda have decided, all right, there's two bad, two Sith Lords. We have to pair off. We're two Jedi, pretty much. I guess that's balance. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so obviously, Obi-Wan wouldn't have stood a chance against Sidious. Yoda barely sort of makes it out of there. So we'll get into the, the, the duel in a minute. But um, he goes to see Padme, and she's obviously in complete disbelief of everything. Um, and then he, he, you know, he walks away, and she doesn't give him anything, and he walks away and it's like, Anakin's the father, isn't he? And she just doesn't say anything. He's like, I'm so sorry. Like, and that one in, in our interaction says so much. It's like, he is probably known. I mean, he obviously in episode two knew that Anakin had like crazy, like obsessive romantic feelings for Padme since they were kids. And then you wonder like how he's been aware of what's going on the whole time that they've been married, that, you know, that they're having a baby together and he's just kept it to himself because he cares about Anakin because he's protecting Anakin from the council in the way that, you know, Anakin never felt like he had anybody looking out for him except for Palpatine, I guess. Yeah. yeah well, it just makes it really devastating that like, you know, you, you because, uh, and uh, because, you know, Palpatine fills that spot in Anakin's life that, you know, Obi-Wan really could have, you know, it's like, like that, that, that father figure, that person who you like look up to and want to be more like. And it's like, I don't think, you know, I don't think by nature of the Jedi that they were ever ever given the space to have that dynamic. So instead Anakin latches onto this really, really conniving toxic person. (laughs) And and you see, and you see all that pain in Obi-Wan, all that like, you know, like, Oh, I have failed you, you know? Oh man. I just love that. What do you, how do you feel about the, I guess, fan theory or, fan, whatever, but that a lot of people feel like they could have um, hinted at the fact that maybe Anakin suspected that Obi-Wan and Padme were having an affair, that there's a little bit of emphasis, there's a, that they could have emphasized that paranoia as an additional element. He even shows up in one, you know, soon after that, um, or I forget if it's there or another, I think it's earlier in the movie where he comes over, he's like, oh, let's go, you know, whatever. He's like, oh, was Obi-Wan here? And he's like, yeah, this morning he stopped by to say whatever. That, like, they could have, if they wanted to, they could have leaned into maybe Anakin being like, all right, what the hell? Now this guy who's essentially my brother is, like, you know, his kind of... uh, lack of trust in her that would have played off later when he's like, you were with him and that whole thing. Like yeah. you could see that when they, when that. they have that big con, when they had that big confrontation right. and he's on, on Mr. you brought her here to kill me. Um, you brought him here to kill me. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I think there were a lot of different, you know, and, and, and having read a lot of behind the scenes stuff about this movie, like there were a lot of different directions that they could have easily taken Anakin's turn to the dark side because the first two movies in this saga were so unfocused and all over the place. Like there was, there was a lot of potential for drama. And I think that was, I think that could have been, that could have easily been a route they would have gone down. And I'm sh- and I do think there was a level of like in that big confrontation on Mustafar when, when Padme gets there and he sees Obi-Wan on the ship. I think there's, if not romantic, there is a level of like, Oh, now you're trusting him, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Oh, now you're, now you're with him. Not even in like a, you know, you're having an affair, but just like this, you know, but at that point, at that point, that's just so pointless. Anakin's just looking for reasons to be angry and to justify his own anger. And I think, I think that was a much better route to take that character dynamic than having Anakin suspect there was an affair that feels kind of, I feels kind of petty. I don't know. It also feels <laughs> but, kind but, of but, thin but since considering what we know about Obi-Wan's character, yeah. that, that doesn't seem like something exactly. Obi-Wan or Padme would do. Yeah. Or that Anakin would, I, I, yeah, it's just, I didn't, I'm sure that was something that crossed George Lucas's mind, but I, but I think like everything else in the movie, he really tried to find like, what was the best, what was the best emotional arc for these characters and what emotional arc made the most sense. And I think, I think the final version is that I think even if some of the dialogue scenes are a little poorly covered and if Natalie Portman's character gets a little sidelined, I think overall, this is a movie that really succeeds in its grand ambitions. And that's more than can be said of some, some good star Wars movies. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I guess we're at, we're pretty much at the, what I'll call the double duel in the climax of this movie, which has always thrilled me because it's basically four of my favorite Star Wars characters, Obi-Wan, uh, Vader, basically Palpatine and Yoda. And then it, it's, uh, how long would you say this whole battle is like 10, 15 minutes of just intercutting? It's a while. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. There's a lot happening there. So, um, I really, I really like the fact that 
the fact that the fact that Anakin and Obi Wan, like it's you can tell that Obi Wan's kind of assessing the situation and realizing how far gone his his friend has has uh, has how far he's gone basically because as I yeah. mentioned earlier, the last time he saw him, they were like, oh, oh, you know, talking about the troubles with the council and all that stuff, and and he was just consoling him as they were just having a friendly conversation, and then when he comes back, it's like the world is on fire basically. Uh, how how do you feel about the, the kind of the lead into that, and uh, I, I guess Christensen's delivery of of uh, you're either with me or you're my enemy, and in, in the way that he's like now. Kind of fully in that, uh, the, you know, we're, we're he's not in that gray area anymore. He's like clearly black and he's clearly white, and we kind of it falls back into, um, you know, the the, the clear cut good and evil. How do you how did you feel about that transition for Anakin to being like a, a full fledged villain beyond beyond all hope? And second part of that question, since this movie does have him doing mass murder, including children. Does that ultimately make his redemption in Return of the Jedi uh, much more problematic? Well, I right off the bat, I think I think it makes his redemption in Return of the Jedi a lot more powerful. Like I think the reason I like that movie is because is because of the redemption and because it allows him the the, the space to have that redemption, but doesn't doesn't necessarily let him off the hook for it. Um, in regards to how how he interacts with Obi-Wan in, the, in that sequence and before that sequence, it is like there, there is a, I, I feel like there's a level of performance to it. Like he is kind of like, this is who I am now, you know, mm. like I am the bad Posturing, guy, but also yeah. I, yeah, but also this, you know, also this, res- yeah, I think there's this resentment of like, you weren't there, you know, <laughs> you know, I think, I think that's deep down in Anakin, but I think there is this, there's this element of him that's frustrated with the ways in which Obi-Wan, uh, Obi-Wan failed him and the ways in which Obi-Wan w- wasn't there for him. And I think he's, he's, he's letting a lot of that frustration out in, in a way that is very, that reads as very, you know, like if you're not with me, you're my, you're against me. And you know, you've been, you're with him and this and that. But I, I you know, I think it's, it's all coming from this place of like, you know, a, a disappointment with Obi-Wan and even a disappointment in himself that he wasn't able to be the, be the chosen one that Obi-Wan wanted him to be. So. Yeah, I mean, in moments before that, he's basically straight up almost murders his wife uh, with the the first on-screen yeah. force choke, and again, chronologically. Uh, oh, wow, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Yeah, that's, a, that I guess, essentially somebody... the first time he has done that as Vader uh, at this point. So, and I, I, you know, to your point about how Natalie Portman goes big on any, everything, the, you know, regardless of how you feel about Anakin's, you know, turn to the dark side or Christensen's performance, she really sells that Anakin, you're you're breaking my heart, you're going down a path that I can't follow. Like she sells that moment to the point that I I get emotional watching her get emotional. Uh, yeah. You know, even though the romance is uh, whatever, um, I, I think she really sells the moment and the tragedy of that, and the fact that he uh, almost. <laughs> kills her even though the whole point of him doing this is supposedly to save her and her and their child um i I think that there's a certain level to to me that i feel in this movie of kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that you know maybe his who knows if maybe his his dreams of her dying in childbirth were incepted by palpatine in some way or or because he has the dreams of her dying in childbirth and so he goes down this whole dark path and then inadvertently kind of causes her death sort of according to palpatine at the end whether you how much you want to believe you know the dark lord of the sith i guess could could, could uh could be up for debate but yeah um, there is a certain element of 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 self fulfilling prophecy to it. Did you ever yeah. pick up on that? Well, yeah. Well, it is. I mean, it is a level of debate. You know, like how did how does Padme die? Well, I mean, you lost know, the world like, to I, live. Uh, I don't know. about Yeah, that. I. But it is like I. I do think like I you made a very cool observation. Nobody's force choked anybody in this series yeah. thus far. I don't think Anakin had any idea that that was as devastating as <laughs> you know i don't think he he i don't even think he intended that to be a a devastating action but you're literally like restricting oxygen to the brain mm-hmm. like <laughs> that's like you know who knows what he was doing to her in that moment you know so i do i i think between that and lost the will to live i like i i don't i'm almost more inclined to believe palpatine i i do think he killed her i do think it was a self-fulfilling prophecy and that makes sense in his character too you know it's like he it's like this 
this, this pursuit of like this pursuit of this one thing and letting everything else, you know, go in favor of it, like really spurred this tragic downfall. Like he was willing to give, he was willing to give up morality for saving Padme. And it's like, well, you can't, you can't do that. Like you, 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 you turn to the dark side and this is, this is what that means. Um, and, and did, did Palpatine put that dream in his head? I don't know. Maybe, um, like we learned in the last Jedi that like, Snoke was, was force linking Ray and Kylo, but there's even some debate around that. So I don't know. I, I look at it. I look at it less from like a practical standpoint and more from like a thematic standpoint, you know, like I think, I think the idea that Anakin ended up inadvertently leave it, leading to Padme's death is just a really, a really solid end to this epic tragedy, you know, that really ties in all the themes together really well. I haven't really thought too much about like, <laughs> how did she die? You know? And it's also, it's also like she gave birth to twins. That's yeah, dangerous. That's know? true. That's true. <laughs> so we don't know what space yeah. medicine is like. Um, it, you know, it, it's also Apparently not good enough to figure <laughs> out that she had twins in the first right? place. Exactly. Like, they're all surprised. <laughs> like, I'm like, you mean you don't have like ultrasounds in this universe? I don't know. I'm willing to suspend that disbelief. It's a long though. time ago. Kind of you don't know who... that wasn't developed yet. I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah. A long time ago in a fa- galaxy far, far <laughs> but it, away. I'm not the kind of person who complains about star Wars for all the space physics. <laughs> right. Right. And stuff, no, so no. it didn't bother me that much. <laughs> it, it's also, I mean, also that moment where he's force choking her, uh, it also basically brings domestic abuse into a movie that's ostensibly for kids. Kind of not really. This movie is not for kids. I think <laughs> well, if, if you're sold. listening to this podcast and haven't figured that out already, this is not a kids. Movie. No, this is a movie where people your age group are getting slaughtered. So you probably shouldn't be watching oh, this. Yeah. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> so then that brings us of course, into the, the battle sequence. Uh, where there's a lot of back and forth between Obi-Wan and Anakin about him failing and, and him be, again saying, I, I just should have known the Jedi were plotting to take over and all of that stuff, which again, as you said, is, is probably a, is a fair point to that it is a level of posturing and also a level of, as I said, mental gymnastics of just being like, well, nope, this is, uh, this is what happened. This is what I, this is what I got to believe to make, to make sense yeah. of my actions. Um, but, and that, that has, that is the more dramatic stakes uh, I, I really get super tickled with the Yoda and Palpatine side of it, where he just bursts into his office and knocks the, the guards over. And there's that, <laughs> there's just Yoda like doing his like martial arts poses to take him down. And then Palpatine, uh, Palpatine really hamming it up. Like this is where me and McDermott is like, all right, I don't need to eat today. I'm about to have a bunch of ham during this scene. So <laughs> <laughs> He's like my little, oh, yeah. my little green friend and all of that good stuff. I love, I love it. all of that stuff is 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 beautiful. Um, yeah. Uh, did you how do you, how do you feel? I guess what did you think of? Because we knew the Obi Wan Anakin thing generally how it was going to play out, and we'll get to the the uh, what's on the again. I'm referring to the soundtrack. You tell I listen to the soundtrack a lot uh, for this movie. The immolation scene uh, with with yeah. Anakin there in a moment, but um, the fact that. Palpatine and, and Yoda take place, uh, their battle largely takes place in the Senate. They're throwing yeah. Senate boxes at each, like, at each other back and forth. And, and, and what I love about it is not only is it uh, effectively a dismantling of one of the more prominent uh, settings in the prequels that was introduced in episode one and kind of plays big roles in all three films, but it's also, again, to go back to the th- theme uh, element of it. It's it's a thematic that he's literally tearing apart the democracy. Yeah, he has to keep yeah. the Senate intact for now until early in episode four, where they're like, "Oh, the last remnants of the Republic has been swept away." But um, you know, in, in the, it's he's basically tearing apart the democracy uh, yeah. that he was elected to uh, you know to protect and, and such. So how, how do you what do you what do you think about that whole sequence and just how much damn fun it is. It is. It's a lot of damn fun. I I think really getting anytime we get to see Yoda in action is a lot of fun in these movies. Um, I think the best lightsaber sequences in all of Star Wars have had a had a weight behind them that isn't just narrated narratively driven, but also visually driven. Like the reason I love that confrontation so much at the end of Last Jedi is because it, 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 you know, because of the way that landscape works, because of like every time you move your foot, there's like this blood red underneath, you know, it's just, it's, it's really beautiful and adds to the drama of that sequence in the same way that like, 
I mean, you, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It's pretty obvious in, in the, in the Yoda and Palpatine fight, you know, like he's dismantling the Senate, get it? Cause he's throwing the Senate <laughs> boxes. Um, and it's great. And it's a lot of fun. I, I, I also like the, the, the Anakin Obi-Wan battle for a similar reason. Like I think, you know, the visual of having two blue lightsabers fighting against a pure red background really, you know, it really speaks to the, the 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 sense that it, these are brothers fighting that these are like friends fighting in this like this encroaching evil and this encroaching doom um i also think it's like it, it's fitting that they set it all at a volcano because a- anakin's being very explosive mm-hmm. and <laughs> everything everything that's built you know throughout the whole franchise is bubbling up to the surface. So haha, I get it volcano, but like, uh, but like it's beautifully, it's beautifully done. And yeah. And like contrasting those two sequences with each other was, you know, I mean, even as a young fan seeing this movie was like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you were when you, I mean like, how did you react when you saw it for the first time? I mean, time? I, I love that. That it's, uh, it's, if it's not my favorite lightsaber duel, and I guess I'm going to cheat and count both lightsaber duels. Cause it's essentially one sequence intercut. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. if it's not my, favorite it's definitely way up there uh and yeah it does lean as i as i said earlier it does lean on a lot of the digital effects and it is very video gamey in some ways that they're like do they really need to like swing on wires while they're lightsaber fighting and then they fall on little platforms and all like that but i, I mean I, I i have no problem with it generally i think it works from a dramatic yeah. standpoint and as you said the clashing of the two lightsabers and that that sequence with anakin and obi-wan it it really drives home again and again how how evenly matched these two are to the point where they're trying to yeah. force push each other and they're kind of locked in a stalemate for a minute where they yeah. until they both fly on opposite sides of the room i mean it's like basically they're at kind of the same level at this point and uh and it's i guess all you really need to win in a lightsaber battle is the high ground apparently um so yeah. <laughs> so um I, you know, I, I really like that, and and uh, the way that it's intercut with with the other say with the other battle, uh, it, it it there's a there's a there's a nice balance between one that's way more dramatic and one that's just kind of having fun with it a little bit. That kind of that that that's strikes just the right balance for for the uh, the tone of this movie, which kind of tends to go as we said the first twenty minutes or so were, were much lighter, and then after that it's just gotten increasingly heavy. And this kind of finds yeah. finds the right way to make it harrowing, but also feel like Star Wars without being too uh, too yeah. dark and overbearing. The, it, it is like the whole movie. It is intentional in a way that I think the first two prequels weren't necessarily, you know, like I, I think the first two prequels, it was very much centered on like, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make the coolest sequence humanly possible? Whereas like this movie felt like a, like an act of, a, a serious act of thematic storytelling. And, it, and, and I think that climax is, you know, it, is the perfect distillation of that. I can only imagine what people that brought small, small children to the, see this film, <laughs> how they, if they made it through the, the child murder, uh, uh, what they thought of the fact that you get an extended sequence of Hayden Christensen basically burning to death. Uh, and, and, yeah. they, and, you know, a lot of that is it's CG mixed with pro- practical effects and prosthetics and yeah. things. But um, it's not, the camera doesn't really pull away until his flame is like flames are starting to flicker out uh yeah. you know uh do you think that 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 moment um was it in necessary to to get into that much level of detail or do you think that's kind of a little extreme for a Star Wars movie totally necessary i think it was totally necessary um i also like you know we're talking about like parallels with uh, with this final sequence like what one of the parallels the one of the parallel cutting acts that really stood out to me is Palpatine turning him into Darth Vader and operating on him and like all of those robots sticking those needles in him and like contrasting that with Padme's labor, which is like in this like very soft room with all these like cooing droids and this and that. And you're cutting back and forth between these two things and you really get a sense of the, the disconnect that has, that has grown between these two characters. And it's, it's really the perfect way to end both of their arcs. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, you really see just where they ended up and, and why they ended up there. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a really sad, powerful sequence. I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Like I'm, 
you know, my, my like people are going to hate me for saying this. I really actually wasn't all that bothered by Darth Vader's no at the I end. Had, I know this is I kind of like a, opening a can. This is kind of opening a can of worms, but like, I know that that was another thing that like, I just always kind of accepted and then found out later on that people like really hated. They were like really pissed that Darth Vader said no. I don't know. Before I get into my thoughts, what are your thoughts? On it that? doesn't, I mean, I think it's a little, a little overdone. I don't think you necessarily need it. I think the, the, the more powerful moment there is him breaking off of the table and smashing yeah. everything. And, and you see like his, and that's why Palpatine is grinning. He's like, Oh Yeah. There's the powerful apprentice I needed all this time, which oh, you yes. see fully <laughs> unleashed in like something like Rogue One, where he's just like a, a, a like a force of nature, and you you get a yeah, little bit of that. Lawnmower. In, yeah, sort of <laughs> the lawnmower man. Uh, you get a little bit of uh, of that here, and I, I, the no is just a touch too too much maybe, but it doesn't it doesn't bother me like as, the way it bothers some people. I them adding the no to the end of Return of the Jedi, I have the issues with where I'm like, okay, now you had something that was perfectly fine, and now you're just fucking it up for no reason. This was all right. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. We, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, obviously, he's not going to be happy if he finds out his wife who he was trying to save by turning to the dark side in the first place. Like, fuck, I'm in this thing. Maybe he should have said that. They have PG-13. They have one F-bomb. Yeah. That's (laughs) that's what you would have said. Um, Then you really couldn't take kids to the movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, that's the problem. The F-bomb, not all the the violence. Oh, yeah, not the the child (laughs) killings. Forget about that. Um, No, but I I, I think I would have appreciated something maybe a little bit more, like, subtle. Like, I think it, you know, I think like like how does Darth Vader cry like that's something that like if I were directing this movie I would have been like you know like what does it look what is like what does it look like for this character who has been the been the image of power and evil for like the last like two and a half decades of filmmaking you know how does this person cry you know it's like that would have been like really powerful and I and I and I I don't like that they opted for something a little bit more operatic you know the no it's like something that happens on stage not something that happens in a movie but it is a very operatic movie so it didn't necessarily feel out of character for the movie I don't know I I it's 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 hard with Star Wars making any kind of Star Wars movie whether it's the prequels or the sequels because it's like people have an attachment people have an attachment to the characters and a vision of the characters in their head that they are very married to. Like that's why so many people had issues with Luke and last Jedi, you know, but, but I think, you know, the minute we, we, we back a story into a corner like that, you know, the, it's never really given any room to grow, you know? Um, and I, and so I like that this movie, you know, I like that this movie takes risks like that with those characters and allows them to do things that we wouldn't necessarily expect them to do. Um, but it also, I think, ends on a very reverent note. Like, I think ending it with that montage of seeing, you know, seeing baby Leia on Alderaan, getting to actually see Alderaan before it gets blown up, <laughs> um, and then seeing, and then, of course, like, ending it with Obi-Wan giving giving Luke to his aunt and uncle is like... That's when I really started. I when I want I I really started crying when I watched th- that this time. I I started crying at that last at that very last scene because it's like it is it it has a real reverence to the Star Wars that we all know and love and looks forward to the original trilogy in a very concrete and powerful way. But yeah, what were your thoughts on 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 the way it ends? Well, actually, in between episodes two and episode three, I remember, you know, I used to think about that a lot. Like, how are they going to tie this up? Like, this needs to happen. This needs to happen. We need to get, you know, how do we get from uh, Anakin and Padme getting married to... Luke is now what 19, 20 years old and going on, you know, Empire has been around and all that stuff. So I, I was really interested to see how this movie is going to satisfyingly get to that point. And the fact that the the basically the last 15, 15, 10, 15 minutes is kind of all housekeeping. It's Padme's funeral with the Japur snippet, with it, which I think I mentioned on the episode one uh, epi- uh, podcast, where I, I, mm-hmm. I talked about how yeah. I love that they brought it back here because it really brings that relationship with them full circle. Um, oh yeah, and totally. and highlights yeah. as you were saying with the the again the soundtrack was birth and rebirth I think that sequence on this on this on the score um, uh, that sequence just how far Padme and Anakin have have 
have uh, traveled from each other, how distant they are. The fact that Anakin, it, it, you know, he just he just turned to the dark side, and he's already ready to overthrow Palpatine. He's like, you and I could you know, we could run the the galaxy as the, make things the way we want to be. That whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I like that this movie takes the time and takes the care to have Jar Jar Binks and Boss Nas show up at the, at the funeral and, and uh, bring yeah. in uh, CO Bibble, the, the governor from um, uh, Naboo, bring in all these characters. Even they even have Genevieve O'Reilly as Mon Mothma there for one shot uh, who, who then reprises oh, right, it in right, Rogue yeah. One. So there's that connective tissue with, with her, with Jimmy Smith, who again came back in Rogue One with obviously Peter Mayhew as Chewbacca. There's, they, they have the connective tissue to make this feel as organic a transition as possible from episodes three to four, you know, minus the technology and all of that. But then you see the construction of the Death Star. You see even uh, Governor Tarkin there. And basically everything's in full on empire mode. It just like, it's almost like flashing, you almost like George is going to pop in the corner, be like, see you in 21, 20 years everyone where, where exactly. he pick it up exactly yeah. from that point and i i think they he he nailed it you know even little details oh, yeah. like even little fun details like um 3po and r2 who go to captain antilles which they mention in a new hope um that uh, 3po gets his mind wiped and r2 doesn't where you're like figures <laughs> r2's the hero he's basically like the the savior of the saga in a lot of ways he's saved everybody's life at least a couple times and 3po oh, is yeah. just constantly whining so it makes sense that r2 would like remember everything know everything and keep it all to himself um little little things like that 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 pay off for for dedicated fans of both this trilogy and the original trilogy yeah it makes sense why r2 like shut down and force awakens because it's like he basically watched a a a remake of Revenge of the Sith with Kylo <laughs> go, turning to the dark side. He's like, side. I, He's like I've been out. through this. He's like, I'm out. I don't want to deal with this anymore. <laughs> you you people don't learn anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I I think this movie doesn't get enough credit for for how well it ties everything up. Um, because that's hard. I mean, like that's really that's a really hard thing to do, and it's something that every prequel, if you're making a prequel, you you are sort of forced to do that, and I. And, and I think, again, like I said, I think this movie balances reverence really well with, with thinking forward and taking the franchise in exciting and different directions. And it still gives you, the, it still leaves you with a, a glimmer of hope that Anakin's kids can redeem, uh, can, can change things down the line. The fact that even Padme is, and obviously this is a callback to Return of the Jedi, it still believes that there's good in him, even after uh, he <laughs> forced stroked her near, to near death. Um, and I, and I yeah. guess at some point Palpatine just gives up the search for Yoda because <laughs> they can't find him in the Senate chamber. And they're, and they're like, we can't find it. Like, we, we double your search or whatever. And I guess just somewhere in 20 years, it's like, ah, eh, it's probably gone. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, you know, it ties things up really beautifully and uh, neat, neat enough that, that it, it feels like a definitive end to this, this trilogy. But, uh, but, you know, leaves obviously room for the, the other stories to follow. Uh, do, yeah. do you think that this was, I mean, obviously Lucas's original supposedly vision was this, these six stories. And I know there was some rumors or whatever back in the day about seven, eight, nine with him doing it. Do you think that it was, do you think it was time for a change of the guard at this point? Do you think Lucas was, was just burnt out? Like, do you, do you think basically, I guess what I'm saying is do you think it's good that these, this saga is now in, in other, other people have their, their opportunity to put their stamp on star Wars, whether than rather than it all coming from, uh, from one source. Oh yeah. 100%. And I think that because I think the series itself I might have said this at the beginning, but the series itself has always been about passing the torch. Like it's always been about the new guard and, you know, newness and, and handing it, handing off a lightsaber or the force or stories to different people and how those people run with those stories. You know, it's like, that's, that's what the movies have always been about. So I think it's very fitting that now you have, now that George Lucas gave it to somebody else to, to do their own thing with, you know, it, it feels very much in line with the spirit of star Wars. You know, I think if it's just one guy, you know, like that's why George Lucas didn't, I know he didn't initially want to direct the prequels. He only did because he couldn't find anyone else to do them. You know, it, you know, he wanted, he wanted that young blood. He wanted people to come in and share their perspectives on it. And I think star Wars has always been good when that's happened. You know, I think it's always, you know, like that's why I was a little nonplussed to see J.J. Abrams come back for Rise of Skywalker. I'm sure the movie's going to be fine. I'm sure it's going to be great. But like it was, 
I was excited to see what somebody else was going to do with it. You know, I was excited to see when, what Phil Lord and Chris Miller were going to do with solo. Like I, like I, I, you know, granted I, you know, I, that version of that movie probably wouldn't have worked, but like, I, I think star Wars has always, yeah, like I said, I think star Wars has always been about passing the torch. And I think, you know, this movie is a very, very solid end to the Lucas era. And I'm, I am, we are, we are full till in this new era. And I'm personally, I'm really digging it thus far. And I think it's been handling the series very, very well. So, um, but we'll see how it all wraps up in December. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, that one, that one so. has the extra added pressure of ending the entire nine part Skywalker saga. This is supposedly, as you know, we said the end of that bloodline, the end of that. So we now will get yeah. other stories like solo, like the Mandalorian on Disney plus and like different, which I think, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy to me in this era of cinematic universes that we're really just kind of followed one family through this franchise for so long. Yeah, it's, no, it's good. It's time I, to move yeah. on to other, you know, other greener pastures, I guess at this point. It's, it's funny that like people keep talking about like, Oh, there's so much, you know, there is a lot of pressure on rise of Skywalker, but like, I do think like the time has come, like it is a really, you know, you know, like Kylo is a very solid character and his arc is obviously leading somewhere very clear, you know, and, you know, all these actors are getting old. Carrie Fisher's not with us, unfortunately, you know, but like, I think it's, it's, it's really time to, to put this part of this saga to rest and really throw the doors open on the rest of this universe. So, so I will be there opening night, (laughs) um, box of tissues ready uh, for sure. (laughs) Um, I'm very, very, very excited. Well, I'm glad that we, we got a chance to, to, uh, schedule this second attempt at recording this episode. And, uh, you know, we actually had way more to say than even I thought we would, but but I'm not surprised in a way because as much as I love, um, Empire Strikes, because obviously I think this is my favorite for the prequels. Empire is up there for me and Last Jedi is up there for me. So, those are the three. Those, those are the, yeah, yeah. those are like, <laughs> I mean, I love a new hope and it's somewhere in that mix and same thing with force awakens, but I feel like those, like those are the three that I probably have the most to say because I'm and yeah. and, and this one specific, well, the last Jedi also. So, but this one specifically, I feel like I have to defend it in a, in a certain respect, uh, just because it is, like I said, it does get lumped in with episodes one and two. And I think yeah. there's a, there's a lot of richness to this film that people are just dismissing oh, yeah. out of hand. And I, yeah, I would encourage anyone that's excited to see the saga come to a conclusion to go back and revisit yeah. the prequels, but specific, pay a specific attention to Revenge of the Sith. No, nah. it's, it's, it's hard for me to be super objective because like I said, this is one of those like incredibly influential movies on me in so many regards. Um, but that being said, it is unlike any other star Wars movie in the best possible way. It is totally operating on its own wavelength. It's got so much to say and says it in a really fascinating way. If you're willing to listen and it's just, it's really good. It's not perfect. It's, it's, it's almost in my mind, it's, it's, it's not a perfect movie, but it's almost better than perfect. It's something that reaches another level of another level of interesting and another, and another level of cool. And like, that's, that's what star Wars has always been. It's always been about pushing the envelope and, and going to exciting new narrative and thematic places. And I'm, and I'm really glad that I had the space and the time to really dig into what I dug about this movie. Um, and I hope you had fun listening to it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, hopefully, you know, we can kind of, uh, lead the charge and, and have, because I do think revenge of the Sith should be in the conversation when people talk about great star Wars movies. And I feel like it's often overlooked for a variety of reasons that we touched on. So, uh, is there anything else about the movie that we haven't talked about somehow? (laughs) After two hours, I think we I think we touched on everything. I think we're, we're almost as long as the actual movie itself at this point. Almost, yeah, it's a long movie. It but, is, but yeah, I think we're almost there. So, uh, so Jackson, do you want to tell people where they can find you on social media? Oh, well, so uh, right off the bat, so um, my my friend Adam Bardard and I, we were on a YouTube channel, which um, which we we do podcasts and video essays on. That's called Screen Fever. Just type in Screen Fever into YouTube. Uh, we're on Twitter at Real Screen Fever, um, and you can find me personally on Twitter uh, at Jackson C Smith ninety five. Um, I do a lot more of my 
nasty political ranting there and then save screen fever for the more, you know, cozy movie related stuff. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, yeah. Check us out. Check out our videos. Uh, we're going to have new episodes of the home experience podcast coming soon. So, um, stay tuned for that. Uh, and yeah, more, more goodness to come. Excellent. Yeah. That's funny that you are talking about your two Twitter accounts and the movies and politics and here people got a little bit of taste of both. So, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a perfect marriage. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a good movie to talk about both of them because it, it, it marries them pretty what pretty well. I yeah, think. absolutely. All right. Well, Jackson, thank you so much for being on the Crooked Table podcast. I will definitely have you back at some point here. Um, but no, I'm glad we got a chance to to share our love for Revenge of the Sith and uh, hopefully turn some listeners on to to the film as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jackson. If you're interested in joining me on the show to chat about one of your favorite films, head on over to crookedtable.com slash guest. Or you can consider supporting the show at patreon.com slash crookedtable. Of course, you can always find more podcasts, reviews, videos, and other movie-related goodies over at crookedtable.com. Until next time, this has been the Crooked Table Podcast, and I've been Rob. This has been a production of crookedtable.com. All rights reserved. That's the yard of a little KED. <laughs> <laughs>